Everything I do at these altars is from the tradition. Things that Agrippa has written, things that are in the Key of Solomon, things that are in the Heptameron. But it's an evolution. It's a new thing, and it's something we can do today because no one's going to kick in our door and execute us and our family for having them. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to the Glitch Bottle Podcast, where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander Eth, and today we are so excited to welcome back to the podcast author, magician, and scholar, Mr. Aaron Leach. Listeners, it's always a pleasure to chat with Aaron, and this podcast is no different, and he covers a wide range of topics that I know you're going to enjoy. I definitely encourage you, though, to listen to Aaron's previous appearances on Glitch Bottle, where we discuss his background, the genesis of his very influential Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, his magical dynamics with his wife and magical practitioner, Carrie Leach, and so, so much more. But in this episode, Aaron talks about the history, the cosmology, the tools, the devotions, and everything else that undergirds Solomonic ceremonial magic. He also shares about the Abramelin Rite and the Holy Guardian Angel, and Aaron talks about his online classes that cover both of these important areas. Plus, Aaron answers your fantastic and amazing Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions, and he talks about how it's so important that you can disagree with others while always being respectful, and so, so many more topics. Aaron also shares a very special announcement of his own in this chat, and now to help us uncover Cork the Uncommon, I give you Mr. Aaron Leach. Aaron Leach, thank you so much for coming back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Hey, Alex. Yeah, I'm starting to kind of consider this a home away from home. <laughs> <laughs> you always have a seat here, Aaron, and I promise you your seat will always be at least five seats away from Rufus Opus. That is a promise. <laughs> hey, I always have fun, even if even with Rufus. <laughs> yeah. <It's fun. laughs> of course, of course. First and foremost, I'd love to just share with the listeners a little bit. I know in November of 2019, Aaron, it was a pretty heavy time. One of your greatest teachers uh, in November passed through the veil. Can you, Aaron, just kind of share about the seminal figure, Oshane Lele? And can you share with the listeners, Aaron, especially if it's the first time that they're hearing about Oshane Lele, who was he? What impact did he have on you and on modern occultism. What would you like the listeners to know? Oh, wow. It was one of my greatest teachers who passed away, and it was very sudden, which anyone who knew him would uh, kind of understand. He wasn't the kind of guy who would just hang around and be sick for for months or, you know, something like that. He went into the hospital thinking that he had something wrong with his neck. They did some more exploration and testing and found out that uh, he had stage 4 cancer. So he passed away very soon after that, actually. But uh, his name is uh, Oshani Lele. Some uh, others know him as Stuart Myers. A lot of people have heard me tell the story of, you know, how I met Oshani, the very, very young neo-pagan in the Orlando, Florida area. I met him at the time when I was becoming more and more immersed in less neo-paganism and more of the, you know, like Golden Dawn and Kabbalah, the, the Western mystery material. It was right as we met, maybe just a little bit after we met, but he was just becoming aware of the Santorian religion, uh, which is Lakumi, and a lot of the Afro-Caribbean material and lore and traditions, Palomayombe and some other things like that. He was very excited about it, and he went off and initiated into the Lakumi tradition. He actually disappeared for a while. He went out out to the northwest, I think, or or somewhere out west, but uh, he came back after a couple of years, and he had taken the initiation. He had not yet been crowned. He wasn't a priest in the tradition, so he was still kind of working his way through their their system. That was when he and I really connected, and we had a lot of very long talks, a lot of long talks about magic. With me, he uh, kind of wrenched me out of the standard modern Western magical mindset where everything is just symbolism, everything is uh, psychology. The names of, the, of God and the spirits are just 
you know, names for parts of your brain, you know, that you're, you, that you're chanting to access and all that stuff. He showed me this more uh, shamanistic, really, this very old style of looking at the universe where it's actually filled with real spirits and real gods and real intelligences that operate in ways that, you know, we as humans don't necessarily understand very well. That magic was, I mean, for, through all of history up until so about the Victorian era or so, magic was about learning the protocols of how to approach these entities and get them to work with you instead of against you. So that's basically a, a, sim- a very simple description of what shamanism has been through throughout history, all the way back to the first tribal, you know, witch doctors. It was because of these talks with him and the way he was able to show me this other world view, I was finally able to really crack the code, I guess you could say, that code being our own modern mindset and see the old grimoires and the old magic that I was trying to study at the time. They started to actually make sense. I could see what the authors were trying to say now because of his, uh, because of Oshani's influence. It was uh, through his advice and counseling and input that I was able to perform the Abermelon operation because at the time that was a grimoire that everyone talked about, but no one had actually really tried. So I decided to go through the entire thing and I had to kind of resort to, to his input on exactly how you become, you know, crowned with, with your guardian spirit. I went off to do Abermelon, which is its own, it's its own story. That's, you know, my path from there. And he continued working his way up, uh, up the ladder in his, uh, in his tradition. And he did eventually become crowned. And he was already writing books at that point. He had published a neo-pagan book just before he and I met. By the time we were having our talks, he was already writing Lakumi books. So he went on to form his own house and his own lineage after he was crowned. And he published a, pretty much a library of some of the best books in existence on the Lakumi tradition and their mythologies and their, their practices and beliefs. And that's basically what he's left behind. He had a magical shop going, but I think that'll probably pretty much die. It was a one-man operation, so I don't see that continuing. But, uh, but his books are, I mean, even people that dislike Oshani Lele for political reasons inside their tradition, they'll still recommend his books. So those are going to live on probably forever. The influence that he had on me, uh, you can see it throughout Secrets of the Magical Grimoires because I wrote that in that period that he and I were talking a lot. And so his influence is just dripping through that book. Everything that I've done and practiced, my, like I said, my performance in the Abramellon operation and everything that's come since has all been on that foundation that he helped give me. So, yeah, his influence is, has gone through different channels out into the esoteric communities and He's had a massive impact, probably bigger than he ever knew. I remember, Aaron, Secrets of the Magical Grimoires was such an impactful book personally for me, especially as I was just getting into what the grimoires meant. And I remember reading it and it opening my eyes going, oh, this is what a grimoire is. And this is the historical context. And this is how, and what you're kind of saying is, of course, those are your words and your experience and everything. But really, Oshani Lele also had just an enormous impact in that. You know, it's not that Secrets of the Grimoires contains his teachings. It's all my own research and my own practice. And, you know, like, as you said, But if he had not opened my eyes in that same way that my book now opens your eyes or other readers' eyes to what is really going on in those old books, I never could have written Secrets that way. I I would have ended up just writing another book about the history of the Grim Wars or something, and, you know, it it wouldn't have had any real impact. Really sorry to hear of Ashana Lele's passing, and I know the listeners and I know myself really appreciate you sharing about one of your greatest teachers for sure. And to that point, Aaron, you mentioned Secrets of the Magical Grimoires. I mean, it is to this day such an impactful book. It literally is the book on Solomonic magic and and especially introducing people to it and walking people through it. Since the time it was first published, you mentioned that there were parts of the book that for you have evolved over time. Can you kind of share about, like looking back on the book, some things that maybe have changed over the years? I always warn people. In fact, sometimes when people have me sign the book for them, I'll I'll even write a note (laughs) with my signature. And the warnings I give people about the book is that, you know, like I said, I was writing this while Oshani and I were talking. 
So even though you see a lot of things in there about, you know, this old shamanic way of viewing the spirits as real, there's still a lot of the older, a lot of my older ideas are there that had not yet, I hadn't really come to grips with yet. So, and the biggest glaring example of that is that I was still at the time very much a dualist. I considered angels to be strictly celestial and good beings and you know, spirits to be these earthbound terrestrial spirits or quote unquote demons. And I had not quite come to grips with the fact that what the grimoires are describing, and this is this is why this is why they're so confusing, especially if you don't understand this aspect of them. They always in their introductions, in their prayers, I mean they always present this very standard Christian dualism. You know, just like I describe angel good, demon bad, you know, the two are opposing forces. And never do they mix. But when you read beyond those and you look at the structure of the universe they're describing, which is basically astrology, it's an astrological cosmology, and the way they're interfacing with the different angels and spirits. And and this has to do a lot with why an angel might appear as an angel in one book and a demon in another book. And vice versa, demons will sometimes, you know, like Asmodeus appears as an angel, Asmodiel, who governs one of the zodiac signs and other sources. The reason is because the authors were not the dualists they were presenting themselves as in their introductory material. And they were referencing this older ancient cosmology that was not dualist. And so there are gods above and there are gods here on earth and there are angels above and there are angels below. They mix all the time. You know, there are spirits associated with the stars and there's angels associated with the underworld. I have a chapter in Secrets that's about angel work and I have a chapter in Secrets that's about working with what I called at the time, goetic spirits, which was a bad choice of term. I wouldn't present it that way now. I would just present, this is how you work with spirits. And some of them are celestial, some of them are chthonic or earthbound. And yes, they can switch back and forth depending on what you're doing with them. And I would have presented it that way. And I don't even refer to higher and lower spirits or angel and demon. I mean, I use those terms from time to time. But I tend to say chthonic spirit or celestial spirit to indicate that these are all the same species of being. It just depends on what they're associated with, what aspect of nature they represent. Yeah, I would definitely get rid of the dualism. Another big thing that would change would be the entire chapter 12, which is all about Goetia, working with terrestrial and chthonic spirits. Number one, that dualism is there. But the second thing is... I was still trying to crack Goetia myself, not not the book called the Goetia, but the practice called Goetia. I really didn't understand it yet, and I was working very hard at that time. Oh, actually, no, when I wrote Secrets, this was even before, I really started working hard with my guardian angel to try to lead me to understand Goetia and make use of it. And it took a very, it took, it took like 20 years, I think, before I really started to get the understanding. And, you know, losing the dualism was a big part of that, to understand the spirits that I wanted to work with. I just feel like I have so much of a better understanding of the tradition now that that chapter 12 would have been entirely different in just the way I presented it and the spirits that are being worked with. Those are the main things. The, the only other thing I can think of, and I used to have a list. So I know there are things I'm forgetting right now, but I know that we have learned a lot since I wrote the book. So the book is dated now. We only recently figured out the Kandari, the, the nine Solomonic pentacles that are mentioned in the Key of Solomon, but not given anywhere. We only recently learned of those, so they're not mentioned in my book. I didn't even realize that that the two conflicting sets of instructions for consecrating talismans that are given in the text is because one was for the Kandari. So I described that in my book with no knowledge that it wasn't even supposed to be for all those talismans at the end of the book. It was two different things. So that would, that would change. And there's just a, dozens of little things like that that I didn't quite understand at the time. Heck, I had not even read, I don't even know if he had written, but I hadn't even read Jake Kent's Geosophia series or his Grand Grimoire or, any, or his Pandemonium. Those were all game changers for me. In my year, <laughs> decades-long quest to finally understand and practice true Goetia. So, yeah, there's a lot that would be updated and expanded today that are kind of in their infant or seed form in Secrets of the Grimoires. Your book is just such a great way of kind of laying 
things out. And to that point, Aaron, you kind of took this amazing book, Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, and you created a Solomonic Magic class that is an online class where you work with students via forums and you also share um, incredible video materials and supplementary materials. Can you just share with the listeners, Aaron, like what is the link between Secrets of the Magical Grimoires and your idea to have this Solomonic Magic class? And what would you like listeners to know about the genesis of the class? First of all, I do have to say very clearly, because I get this question a lot, is they say, you know, are your classes just that book, but just broken up into, you know, class form? And the answer is absolutely no. While Secrets of the Grim Wars, even though I say it's dated just because there are details and things we've learned through actual historical study that have, you know, opened our eyes to a lot of things, it is still a good foundation, you know. So if you've already got that book or you get that book, it's definitely a good start. Uh, the first part of the, the entire first half of the book is history and all of that stuff. It's, you know, I mean, we understand the history a little better today, but I don't think, I can't think of anything in that half that I'm, that I would disown today. So the first half of the book's still great, and everything's laid out really good in a step-by-step uh, practical sense in the second part. It's mostly in there that I've evolved a little bit on some of my techniques and refined some things. But Now, as for the classes, no, the, the classes are not that in class form. Um, in fact, it's kind of a good segue because everything I said that is outdated or needs to be fixed, or that I have better understandings of today that is not President Secrets, that's kind of what the classes are. To be honest with you, I kind of took a little of my idea of the structure of these classes from Oshani Lele, because one of the things that he did in his Delagoon is a divination, a form of divination, a class. Before he would teach his students any of the divination techniques, he first gave them the lore and the mythologies and the stories of all the Orisha and all of the entities that are involved in the divination process that he would teach them afterward. Because you can't use that divination system without knowing all of the lore. That's the way the spirits talk to you. You know, they'll give a sign that indicates this story. And then that story is the Orisha telling you how to handle that situation. I kind of got the same idea in my case was, you know, I'd give all the history and stuff. There's a little bit of repeat and this history section, class one, and what's in the first half of Secrets. But again, it's a little more refined. And there are things in here I don't mention in Secrets because I didn't really know them yet. So that's kind of an expanded version of that. And then class two is all of the lore, all of the old biblical stories, and the Midrashim, the Hebrew stories uh, about the archangels and how they interacted with each other and how they interacted with human beings and Back in my very early days of studying the Kabbalah and those kind of traditions, I, I discovered uh, Lewis Ginsburg's Legends of the Bible, and I just ate that up. I mean, it was all the archangels and angels presented in the same way that the Greek stories about the, their gods and the Roman stories about their gods were presented, you know, in a, in a much more kind of down-to-earth way, like they were real beings up there fighting back and forth with each other and with us and all the drama and high schoolery, you know, that goes on in those stories. It was there in the biblical tradition, too. So I present a whole lot of that material, a lot of it drawn from Ginsburg in class two, to introduce you to the seven archangels that I'm then going to proceed to teach you how to work with from there on. And it just progresses through different lessons, learning their correspondences, learning, consecrating your different magical tools, creating them properly, consecrating them properly. And then I go on from there to something else I didn't mention in Secrets because I hadn't even gotten there yet in my own practice, but I actually teach how to establish altars to these entities and to begin working with the altars and actually bringing their presence directly into your home on a permanent basis. They become house gods. They become part of the family. So, yeah, this is... Very different from what was in the original Secrets. The only connection is that it was people who read Secrets who kept begging me to create classes. I resisted for years because I couldn't figure out how to present what's basically a very shamanic, a very nature-based system into a class form. You know, something like the Golden Dawn, that's university magic. You can sit in classes like at Hogwarts and take notes and study the Golden Dawn system. But 
with these old, more witchcraft style systems, you have to have kind of an apprenticeship. You just have to learn from someone who's doing it and you see them do it and you take part in it. And so again, Oshani Lele is where I got the idea from on how to take something very old magic like that and present it in a class form. And you, you do it through the mythology and through the storytelling. And so that's the, the way I went with that. I finally got the idea and I finally finalized the, the form of the classes. The only thing about the book is that students often say if they have the book or if they get the book when they start the class, they've really enjoyed going through both at the same time. Apparently, they say that it's like, I'll hint at things in the classes, but that they'll be fully elaborated in the book. And maybe I do that because I knew I had already written them in the book. I don't know, but they say it just works out that way. So they do like having this thicker book that they can go through and get further details on things that I cover in these, you know, these classes that only last maybe a couple hours a piece. Can you talk a little bit about how you will have videos and supplementary materials and, and really like PDFs and, and sheets and kind of things that really do condense a lot of the information that is just so great because you kind of have everything all in one place. Can you kind of talk about that? It depends on the class itself uh, and how much material needs to come with, you know, each one. Each class is a recorded lecture, so you'll actually see me sitting there talking at you. It was originally done live, so there will be people that are typing questions and stuff, um, and I think I did a question and answer session at the end of each one. But once the live recording's done, I just leave them up for further students to come in. So you can come in and just watch these anytime you want at your own pace. So you have the recorded lecture. And then back to where I was, once we get to the practical material, you'll get a lot of PDFs rather than me telling you, well, you need the key of Solomon because that's where this is. Well, this one you need the hex hammer on because that's where these are. I just collected it all and I made PDFs and they're arranged differently. These aren't just copies of the, the pages in the book. It just takes what is from, say, the key of Solomon, you know, like the consecration of holy water. And then I, I've rewritten it, you know, in a step-by-step, -step, okay, first do this, now do this kind of fashion. I, I kind of fix some things and rearrange things and, and make it a little more logical to a modern reader. Whereas in the grimoires, it was more about just compiling information. You know, they, they would usually just take notes and add to each chapter as they found new stuff. So I'm just taking all of that and putting it in, into its proper step-by-step -step order for you. So by the time you get through, especially the tools section, you're just going to have your own miniature grimoire worth of PDFs. I mean, especially if you print them all out, you need to actually carry that into the, your working space with you when you're working with these uh, entities. And of course, there's still more in the practical working section, too, where this is just a beginner's class. So I make it very clear there's, there's no conjuration of spirits here. Uh, there's no Goetia here. That's all going to be in the 102 material. I had to take kind of a year off, so I apologize to everybody who's salivating for the one or two classes. <laughs> I swear they're about to get pitchforks and torches. My New Year's resolution is I'm going to get that material done like in the beginning of this year. So that's where all that hardcore stuff will be. But at the end of this beginner's class, after you get your tools made, we cover how to make talismans and consecrate them. And then we go into things like psalm magic. I give an actual magical operation you can use, which is basically it's, it's based on the novena structure that Catholicism and, and other Christian sects use, uh, the, the nine-day prayers at the altar of a saint, basically. And like I said, I tell you how to set up the altars to them and work with them and make offerings to them. And then I also wrap the whole thing up with simple candle magic that you can do. In fact, I'm going to be making a video on that pretty soon about the, the kind of candle offerings that I do here. And I give a similar setup in the uh, classes. So by the end of it, you will be working with these entities and doing your magic. It's just that I didn't want to get into the chthonic stuff, the underworld stuff, until I knew my students had had some time to work with their guardian spirits and the archangels so that they would have some protection and, and some, you know, some actual experience with working with this kind of energy before they start delving into the harsher material to that point aaron like for instance history why do you start with laying out some of the history of the grimoires and as you've intimated what are some of like the biggest things aaron that people misunderstand about the history of the grimoires what are some of the most common things that you are constantly having to either remind people of gently or maybe re-educate people on what would you like listeners to know why do I start with history? Because 
And this is a point that I made so often in Secrets of the Magical Grimoires itself that remains true, is you pick up a grimoire and you look at it with your own modern eyes and assumptions. And I mean, even down to definitions of words, they're just not going to make any sense. And that was my experience. That's been so many thousands of people's experience. But if you actually understand the world and the culture that existed at the time those books were written, then that's going to give the context that you need to understand what the texts are saying. So that's why I always start out with the history, kind of lay out the world. I, I kind of world build. I kind of create a, an idea of what these guys were doing, what they were, why they were writing this stuff, what they were attempting to accomplish with it, and also who they were. You know, understanding who these guys were is very important. Once you understand their motivations, then the books start to make sense. And so I always start there. Then, Aaron, you talk about the cosmology. And for the listeners out there who maybe it might be their first time getting into Solomonic magic and kind of learning, can you lay out the cosmology and kind of just share the very basics of the cosmological structure of the grimoires, especially because people hear things like there's the Egyptian slash PGM cosmology, there's the Kabbalah, there's like so many words that are thrown around and terms. So can you just lay out the basics for like the cosmology? Well, it's actually very simple. I think I say it this way in the class, and I'm going to reveal the big secret on how to understand the entire cosmology, that is how the universe works within the grimoires, and it is astrology. It's that simple. The entire thing, every angel that is called, every spirit that is worked with, the whole thing from beginning to end, the Solomonic tradition and all the traditions that form the pillars of it in history have been about astrology. You look up into the sky and those stars are angels and you're trying to read them to get messages from God and you're trying to call them down in order to get prophecies and information and help. For instance, think of your natal chart. You know, a, a magician at that time would have had his natal chart done and he would have seen where all these stars, where all these angels were at the time of his birth. And he would begin to work with those angels to strengthen the good parts of his birth chart and to weaken and eventually ameliorate the uh, negative aspects of his birth chart. The astrology is the cosmology that the authors of the Grim Wars were describing. You also, Aaron, talk about the planets and the elements. And there might be some people out there, again, if, if, if they're just getting into this, wondering like, Wait a second. Okay, so Samael and Mars and Tuesday are all associated, and Casael and Saturn and Saturday are all associated, and there are zodiac signs that are under each of those days, and like, how do the angels fit in? How, how did the seven days of the week come about? Can you give us just kind of a broad overview of the planets and the elements? It's entirely astrological, and it also happens to be uh, what was pretty universal among most human civilization for a very, very long time. You can go all the way back to uh, reading Ezekiel's vision of the divine throne, um, or you can go um, to the book of Revelation and see St. John, the divine's description of the throne room. And they describe a few different details, but they're both essentially describing a zodiac chart. God's throne is in the center. God's throne, the earth, is in the center. And he is surrounded by these four beasts, and those are the four elements. Those are the four foundational structures of everything in created reality, which is, of course, that's all drawn from alchemy with the four philosophical elements. Surrounding these four forces are the seven angels who stand and praise God at all times. They stand eternally before God. And those are the seven planetary angels, including Samael, which confuses a lot of people. But if you look at the Old Testament, the only place where Satan is actually really talked about in, in the Old Testament is in the book of Job. And yep, he's described as standing there seeing praises to God right in the first chapter. Once you have these planets, think of an astrological chart, including your birth chart. The earth is in the center. So now you have these seven angels, which are the seven planets that orbit around the Earth. It's a, remember, it's geocentric. The Earth is the center. I always call on Einstein's loophole for that. You can, you can set any spot in the universe as the center and do your math from there. So in this case, you're, setting, you're starting your math from Earth. And so the seven planets are spinning around us. And then, of course, around these seven angels, 
are described these 24 elders. The 24 elders are supposed to be from the 12 tribes, which is two elders per tribe, and these are actually the 12 signs of the Zodiac. That's the structure that uh, the people who wrote the Grimoires were basing their ideas on as well. Your seven archangels are in control of these 12 signs, and the 12 signs are each in groups of three. They all represent those four elements. So everything in created reality comes down from these forces. The sign, which in your birth chart represents, you know, each sign represents a different house in your birth chart. So it's a different area of your life or it's a different aspect of creation that comes down through one of the signs. But these signs are all being governed and commanded by these seven archangels. They're the workmen. They're the ones who actually build everything and put everything together. That's your basic cosmology right there. And, you know, going back to what, you know, like I said, I, Moshani, that we approach these entities as real. So what the grimoires are, are about how to approach these workmen and basically ask for favors from them. And uh, but really, I always teach you know, to build a relationship with them, to make friends out of them so that they work behind you, they work for you rather than working against you. And that goes back to what I said, too, about being able to strengthen the good parts of your birth chart by working with these angels, being able to ameliorate the negative aspects of your birth chart by working with these angels and becoming friends with them. It all comes back down to the stars. As well, Aaron, can you share about magical timing and purification? So, you know, when I was reading um, Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, that was the first time I came across the phrase that I use all the time now, which is the day and the hour, the day and the hour of Raphael, the day and the hour of Mikhail, the day and the hour. Can you share a little bit about what are these kind of planetary hours? How do they fit into, as you mentioned, the seven days of the week? Once again, I'm going to go right back to astrology, because as we look back through older and older texts, you don't really find so much about those magical hours and days of the week. They're there, but they're not, some set, they don't, they're not really stressed. And there are texts that don't use them at all. The older the text, the more it relies on full astrology. If you're going to work with Mars, you're not really concerned with whether it's Tuesday or what hour of the day it is. Instead, you'll, you're going to sit there and cast charts, astrological charts, for all the different desired times that you can think that, to do the work until you find one where the planet Mars is in a specific position and the moon is in a specific position and the sun is in a specific position and all the rules on, on astrology on what makes something auspicious or if it's something you should steer away from. So when you find the perfect time when Mars will be the most strongest, where it'll be the most positive toward whatever goal you're trying to work in, in this example, then you would have to do it at that time. Now, as far as the hours and the days of the week and all of that, now, there's a long history behind the association between the days of the week and the seven planets, you know, and why these different deities were chosen to name our day, you know, our days after. Well, the sun and moon for Sunday and Monday are obvious, but Tuesday is from an old, I think, Celtic, if I remember correctly, war god. Or no, actually, he may have been Nordic. Thursday is, of course, Thor's day. Friday is Freya's day. She was a love goddess, a mother goddess. So I don't know the whole history of how that got adopted into our culture necessarily, but it was already established by the time the Grim Wars came around. Um, and what you're seeing with the use of the days and the hours of the day, that's actually kind of a simplification in a way of the older use of full astrological timing for the spells. The idea was that as these books spread, and if you read the, the histories like Owen Davies' History of the Grim Wars, some of the, there's really good books out uh, these days about the history, about the culture that gave rise to the Grim Wars. And a lot of people using them were not educated enough to be casting full astrological charts. That was a, kind of a specialization in those days. The magical hours seem to have been created as like a layman's version of using the full astrological timing. So you may not be able to cast a dozen charts to figure out when Mars is strong, but we know that Tuesday is the day of Mars because of its name. We can pretty much guess that sunrise, when that, when that sun is coming up and defeating the darkness, is going to be the most powerful time for Mars. And then, you know, some other times, like, you know, when he's directly ahead at noon and stuff like that. But we know Mars should rule that first hour because it's his day. And then as you go through the sequence, 
every hour is ruled by one planet in a specific order. And so exactly seven hours later, Mars would rule again. And then seven hours later, Mars would rule again. When you follow the pattern through and you stick to that specific order of planets, sure enough, the first ruling hour of the next day, Wednesday, is in fact Mercury, which is his, that's his day. And since that pattern actually works and it holds through the entire week and loops back around without an, without an error, nothing has to be repeated or left out, then that kind of gives it its own, I want to say mathematical legitimacy. It works. It's clearly a system that works. So that gave non-astrologers a way of finding a sacred time to work with a particular entity if they couldn't figure out what deacon the sun is in and what the ascendant is and where, you know, that's basically where that arose. It was almost like a popularized form of very simple astrology. Especially, I remember when I was, you know, first kind of learning and continue to always learn new things. One of the things that you mentioned and that really helped me as well is that you are always safe. If you're worried about the day and hour and calculating, you're always safe at sunrise for each day of the week. Like, you know that that's the day and the hour, right? Absolutely. And not only that, but since we are talking about this particular class, I do give in this class a crash beginners course in astrology. And and I should point out, especially for the listeners, that when we say astrology in this conversation, we are talking about Renaissance style astrology, not modern astrology. For example, there's, there's no, the three outer planets have nothing to do with this system. What I teach is a very basic and simplified form of Renaissance astrology. So you will, at the end of that class, have more than enough information, including handouts and everything else, to cast your own very simple elections just just to make sure that the planet you're working with is strong. I also teach the hours and days system, so I try to combine them when I can. When I'm casting my astrological elections, if I can find a really good one that also happens to be on the proper day and hour, then I always go for that. So you'll learn all of that in that particular class. There's so many different grimoires, so many different traditions. And I know yourself and Frater Chassan and many, many others say that, you know, it, it's always a good idea, especially if you're first starting out to, you know, pick a grimoire or a system or something and stick with that and kind of see what you think and, and follow the recommendations and the specifications in the grimoire. Can you kind of talk about that, especially, for example, Mikhail is associated with soul, with the sun. And as you mentioned, there's a ton of overlap between Mercury and Mikhail and and a lot of kind of fluidity there. But like Agrippa, for example, has Raphael in soul. So can you just kind of talk about if someone is just kind of comparing things and they might see differences between them in terms of angelic assignments and planetary assignments? Yeah, there is some fluidity there. First of all, I think I make a pretty big point in Secrets of the Magical Grimoires about, you know, just pick a grimoire and stick with it and don't mix it and don't match it. To be honest, I've kind of relaxed on that a little bit over the years because I've come to understand that no grimoire is an island. It's not completely disconnected from the larger tradition that it's a part of. I've also come to learn that there really was more of a connected tradition going on there among all these grimoires, all these old European occultists than we assumed at first. And I don't mean in the sense that, oh, there was some underground brotherhood or anything, but I mean in the sense that as more and more texts have come to light, I mean, they've been studied, we've come to understand that there were things that they taught each other and things that stayed cohesive throughout the tradition that weren't really visible before we had access to more text, if that makes sense. So, you know, like, for instance, I mentioned the Kandari that we've come to understand. Well, it turns out the Kandari are all over the place. Once we knew they existed, we started finding them all over the place. The entire Solomonic tradition in the medieval era that had nothing more for communication than horses, they all knew about these Kandari. They were so, in fact, they were so commonplace that most grimoires don't even mention them. It would be like saying, you know, hey, make sure you pick a room with air in it. I mean, well, of course. So we're learning more of that. We're learning that there is a connection between these texts. We're learning about the spirit hierarchies. Oh, well, it says this in this book and this in this book, and I'm confused. But now we have more texts, and we can look at the larger tradition. And it's like, you know what? There is a fluidity. There are some texts that kind of go off in their own their way. 
but there is still a common thread to all of this. You can see the hierarchies develop and change as they move through history in a more in a much more obvious way that we couldn't see before. You really can't just take one grimoire. Now, I'm going to go back on that and, and say, you know, don't just go, well, I like this conjuration from this grimoire, and I like this from this grimoire, and I'm just going to build my own ritual. No, I mean, if you're going to use the system that's presented by a grimoire, then use that system. But I don't think you'll be able to do that without also reading other grimoires and getting a bigger context for what might be said or not said in the grimoire you're reading. My favorite example of this is one of my uh, bigger failures in magic. I, uh, I mean, this is well after I'd done Abermellon, but I decided to experiment with one of the formulas in the second book, the one that George Den and Stephen Guth restored to the text because Mathers had deleted it. And it's this book of little witchcraft formulas. It's basically psalm magic. You write this script, you know, this psalm verse, you know, on this piece of wax, and then you go bury it, and then, you know, the magic is done. So going on the idea that I shouldn't add or subtract or anything, I would just follow what this little, what this little formula that I decided to try told me to do. I did it. What I wanted to do was it, you create seven wax tablets to protect the boundaries of your of your home. So I made these and I buried them exactly the way the book said around the property. Two interesting things happened. Number one, within I think it was about 12 hours, some neighborhood kids came up onto the porch and stole a bunch of stuff. So failure number one. <laughs> and the other interesting thing was it didn't happen with all seven, but on the very last talisman that I buried, grass just stopped growing there. It remained a bare spot for the entire time that talisman was buried there. And it was the one buried right next to the driveway, which was the main entry and exit point for the entire property. And that one was would not even allow grass to grow back over it. I couldn't just talk myself into saying, well, you know, it worked in a philosophical sense. You know? <laughs> so, no, this, is a, this was an obvious black and white failure. I mean... I wasn't sure what to do at first, but it was right around that time. These things tend to come out just when you need them. But Avalonia Press published a treatise on mixed Kabbalah and a collection of magical secrets, I think it's called. And it's actually two manuscripts. That's actually two different books they kind of put together because they're both real short. But the one that was a treatise on mixed Kabbalah, I was like, whoa, interesting, because I'd never heard of it mentioned outside of Abramelin. So was this not something that, you know, Abraham the Jew came up with himself? Was this actually a tradition? And there it was. And not only was this explaining the mixed Kabbalah, but it, it made no reference to Abramelin. There was nothing in that book that seemed slightly like someone had read Abramelin and then tried to create this. It was its own thing. I even found out it had precedence in history because it was psalm magic, and it was connected to the Book of Gold, and it was connected to uh, Godfrey's use of the psalms. Yes, this was a real tradition. The mixed Kabbalah was a real thing, and it gave full instructions on this eight-day-long ceremony you have to follow in order to consecrate the wax tablets. <laughs> I believe I dug up all the other talismans, or maybe I just left them there considering they they were inert, except I'm sure I dug up the one in that bare spot and got rid of it. But one way or the other, they were no longer a concern. And I performed the full eight-day ceremony and put these new things in, and we made we actually did an invocation. of uh, We did it through Samuel, and we did a big invocation of Samuel and fed him, and we took the offerings out. I mean, we just massively did this one up with all the energy we could, and we had one hell of a wall of protection. And I've got several stories about, you know, things that have happened that, you know, clearly people, bad people were repelled by something that was stalking around the borders of that property. <laughs> so that one definitely worked. So, you know, this is a good example of by just sticking to this one grimoire, I didn't realize he was just assuming you already knew all this other stuff, so he didn't mention it. And But here it was in this other book. So in, in that way, one book informed the other. So, you know, I, never, I would never say just mix and match things just because you like it, because this magic isn't really about what you like. It's you're trying to get on the good side of this entity. So it's really more about what the entity likes. But that doesn't mean the books can't inform each other, and that doesn't mean there's really a cohesive tradition. Now, you did bring up the soul and mercury thing, so I do want to I want to mention that because I get asked that all the time. It's become kind of cliche in the Solomonic group for new members to come in and, hey, what about, you know, why does this switch? Is that a mistake? The thing is, it's not really so much a mistake, but if you look through this tradition, 
and follow its threads. And even if you go back into like ancient pagan mythologies and such, solar and mercurial spirits have always had this weird interrelationship. There's just so many similarities between the attributes of soul and mercury. Both of them are known as healers. Both of them are known to have special access in and out of the underworld. The similarities just stack up between these guys more so than most other uh, planets would be similar. So from source to source, you will find some switch. Like, I believe the magical calendar was the first to switch them. Or I should say the first to show Michael and Sol and Raphael and Mercury. And people who kind of followed that established, that became kind of a current. Uh, people who were using the magical calendar, they had that on their bookshelf. Their texts would tend to have that arrangement. But then I think like the older Kabbalistic arrangement has... Michael and Mercury and Raphael and the sun. So people who had that as their source instead kind of followed that. But the two can actually switch back and forth very easily. So one is not correct over the other. That is such a great point. And I know, as you've mentioned on, on forums, for example, with the Eleuchidarium, the kind of proto-Heptameron group, I know Joseph Peterson's doing a lot of great work uh, tracing the historical threads and talking about how De Abano in you know, the early 1300s uh, drew from some Jewish sources and put Mikhail in Seoul, but then other Jewish sources at the same time period and even before in the 1100s might have had Raphael in Seoul. So I think that's kind of what you're saying is that even though one source may have one archangel and the other source may have another, if you go way back to the kind of similarities that these kind of groups had, Mikhail and Raphael, both of them being involved in healing, that like the further you go back, the more similar they are. Even all the way back into, you know, past the biblical stuff, you go into like Greek mythology. I mean, Apollo and Hermes, they, they would attribute them to Mercury or the sun, just depending on what they needed, you know, at the time. There's a lot of switch over, switch back and forth between solar and mercurial entities that it just seems to be a continuing tradition. If you're using one particular text, like for a long time, I had a seal of truth that comes from Dee's, uh, John Dee's Anakian magic. And I had switched Michael and Raphael from his. He has Raphael in, in the sun and Michael in Mercury. And I had it switched. But it always nagged at me because doing that switch changed all the God names and all the names on it. So either I had a seal of truth that was effectively depowered and gibberish, or I had unlocked some great secret and had really created a restored one. No, the feeling I got from the angels was, no, you just screwed up the seal of truth. Go make it right. So, you know, so I just stuck with what the angels had given D, which he got a lot of his correspondences from Agrippa. So I just stuck with that. Even though in my work, I go with the Heptameron, which has Michael in the sun and Raphael and Mercury. So it just kind of depends on what you're doing, and it depends on what aspect of the angel you want to call. I mean, you, you could call Gabriel from the moon. That's his Heptameron association. But his name is Giborel. You could call him from Mars. In class two, where I go over all the legends of the angels, yeah, the older legends of Gabriel was that he was a bloodthirsty badass. <laughs> he calmed down a lot by the New Testament when he was floating in to inform the, the Mother Mary that she was going to have the, the divine child and all that. That wasn't the, the Old Testament Gabriel. The Old Testament Gabriel where was knocking over buildings and stuff like that. So, again, it just it depends on what aspect you're calling them in. So you should never feel that any of these lists of correspondences you get from any book are just the hard and fixed, it can't change, chiseled in stone way it is. Every entity has a celestial aspect and has a, a chthonic aspect. Every time a planet passes into a different sign, he takes on a whole new personality, a whole new mood. It can be an entirely different angel from the one you contacted under a different sign. So it is very fluid, and you just have to accept that that was the culture. It is that fluid. And, you know, a lot of people just they they kind of stop there. It's a roadblock for them. They don't want to pr proceed until they can figure this out. And the answer is it's it's just fluid. These entities can be called from all sorts of different forces depending on what you're trying to do with them. So, 
I really like how you phrase that. No grimoire is an island, and each of the grimoires, I think of it as kind of like waves, you know, stacking upon waves and merging on the shore, you know, like each of them kind of influences one and the other. I mean, for instance, and correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but in the Anakian system, the kind of seal that D uses, if you go back to the Sworn Book of Honorius and the Seal of God, there are clear similarities between those two as well. Absolutely. I, I'll tell you something. I can tell you from direct experience, there is n- nothing slightly unusual about asking an angel, how do I do X, Y, Z? And the angel says, that book on the shelf behind you says how. And I get that question about the Abermelon system, too. They're like, I don't understand. If, if you if you go through Abermelon, and I wasn't being asked. This was posted to a group. But if you go through Abermelon, why would you be interested in any other grimoire? You have a complete system there with the spirits and your angel and your familiars. And that was the exact answer I gave. I say, well, you, your guardian angel teaches you magic. But that doesn't mean that part of her lessons aren't going to be, or his or her lessons aren't going to be, hey, just go get that book over there because it has the instructions you should use. And then maybe as you're doing them, your angel will inspire you with, okay, now tweak that. Okay, change that. Well, that needs to be this. Just because you're learning from an entity doesn't mean that they won't direct you to already written sources. You're not going to get completely alien and new material. At least that hasn't been my experience at all. They they don't like to repeat themselves. <laughs> you know. So if some other magician in history has already been taught how to do this thing and already written down the instructions, they're not going to sit there and just repeat themselves to do it all again for you. They're going to tell you to get off your butt and go do some actual book study. <laughs> One of the things that I like how you break things down, which was super, super helpful to that point, Aaron, was talking about the basics when it came to the tools and the materia magica. I I remember the first time that I cracked open a key of Solomon and I was like, oh my gosh, there are so many sigils and so many consecrations and so many incenses and where do you start? And and what I love in the class, but also in, in Secrets, is you kind of lay out the system, which, at least for me, I kind of breathe a sigh of relief because I was like, oh, okay, this is how you start. Start with the salt and the holy water. Can you just kind of walk us through, like, for people just opening the key of Solomon for the first time, what are like the first one, two, or three tools that you you pretty much have to create first in order to operate and then do other tools and, and things like that? In fact, that is what this particular class we're discussing is about, is just here here's the very first thing you'll need, and here's how to do it in a very straightforward way. And of course, I reference, I tell you where to find all this stuff. I basically follow the key of Solomon for the most part. That's kind of the go-to for any grimoire you're using. You know, a grimoire might say, get and properly make a wand, you know, and, but it won't really say how because the author assumes you've probably got the key of Solomon on your shelf already. Or the fourth book of occult philosophy is also a good one. But I use the key of Solomon because it gives fairly con- clear and concise instructions on how to make the tools. But I, I still rearrange them and make them proper step one, step two, step three for you uh, in the material I give you. And that's part of all the handouts that you can print out for yourself. And you said you wanted me to go over like what you need for this tradition you know, to start with. And honestly, you're going to start with your basic, not the working tools so much, but they're kind of ingredients in a way. But you're going to start with making the holy water and then you're going to make incense. The reason for that is you need those two things to consecrate everything else. So I go over the whole water making ceremony and I go over the uh, prayers you'll need for consecrating incense, which is really the easiest thing to do. I mean, it's just a couple of prayers. He doesn't, they don't really go too far in that, but you do sprinkle it with the water. And once you have those two things, then of course you're going to have to consecrate a light source. We go from there into making the proper candles. After that, then I start talking about the actual tools you're going to have. So, you know, you're going to have to have a sensor. You don't have to make it. It should be something that's appropriate. You know, don't get some, you know, just whatever sensor's laying around. It has to be a very nice sensor, maybe brass or or something like that. And it has to be specifically set aside for this use. And then I believe I go into the water sprinkler. The water sprinkler is kind of a predecessor. I don't mean historically, but I mean in the tradition. The water swinger is kind of a predecessor to the wand that you'll make later. It's really a, a miniature wand with a bunch of herbs tied around it, but it, it has to be done in a certain way with specific sigils. And again, step by step, I take you through all of that. Even the wood has to be gathered in a very specific way under the right magical timing. 
there's your basic setup. I mean, you could literally go and do almost anything with just what I mentioned. You've got your sensor and consecrated incense, your consecrated light source, uh, your candle, and your holy water. You can do exorcisms with that. You can consecrate anything with that. Everything comes down to those basic tools. I also go into making the white-hilted knife, which is your general arts and crafts tool. You'll use that to cut string. You'll use that anytime you're making another tool. I believe I cover the burin because you'll need that for etching sigils into your other tools. Now, the wand is actually not for angelic work for the most part. Basically, it exists to command spirits. So I actually thought of leaving the wand as well as the black-hilted knife both for the second course because especially the black-hilted knife, that is for commanding spirits. That is a Goetia tool. So, But I decided to go ahead and bring the wand into the first course because it's not quite as goetic as the, the black-hilted knife. I mean, you could carry it in front of an angel and not offend the angel. It's just that you don't really use that. You're, you're not picking up a staff of authority to command an angel. You're just actually talking to them and putting petitions before them. You're, they're kind of, you know, the big guy here. So, <laughs> But it's kind of a crossover because while you use the wand for commanding spirits, the same way you'd use the black-hilted knife, but it's also, it kind of belongs to the celestial forces. It doesn't belong to the earthly, terrestrial, and chthonic spirit for, forces. And plus, maybe it's just, I don't know if it's true in the Grim Wars as much. Maybe it's just, you know, the legends and mythology that's arisen since. Maybe it's because of Harry Potter. I don't know. But there's this idea that there's kind of a special connection between you and your wand. You know, your wand chooses you. I went ahead and made that part of the first course as well so that they could make their wand or have their wand made and start to actually have that as part of their regular ritual setup and start building a relationship with the spirits that will be attached to that. That pretty much completes the basic set of working tools. I do go over, you know, your robes and what they should or can look like, and there's there's a lot of information there that you'll get in the class because you can wear a wide variety of different things for this magic. I don't think at this point I talk too much about setting up altar, but I think I do tell you how to set up a basic sacred working space. So that's in there as well. So, you know, your basic white covered altar and that kind of thing. I think that's it in that particular class without getting ahead of myself. To that point, Aaron, there's also a section you spend on talismans. Aaron, when it comes to talismans, so many people throw around different words. Talisman, amulet, pentacle, phylactery. Can you just give us from your experience and kind of what you share in the class, what are the main differences between these things or how important or maybe even not important are those differences as you see them? All these different names are just different names that different people have used for the same basic things. There's no way to make a difference, you know, that, you know, an ambulance means this, but a talisman means that, and a pinnacle means that. It, those words were used very liberally by different authors throughout the entire tradition. Something like, like a phylactery, I mean, at least stands out in that it would have a band around it that you'd wear. <laughs> you wear a laman around your neck, and there are some texts that refer to that as a phylactery as well. But as far as their function and how you make them and all that, they're all the same thing. You know, it's a physical object that not every talisman specifically has a, a specific spirit attached to it, but in most cases, or with most practical talismans, you are making an object, a physical object, and you're making it at the proper times, out of the proper materials, with all the proper invocations and ceremonies over it, so that it will be inhabited by the spirit you want to work with. Talismans, but also magical images like Agrippa, and he got this all from the old Arabic Picatrix, talks about actually carving wax figures of different images of different people and animals and turning those into talismans. You can do it by drawing those same people and animals on consecrated parchment with consecrated ink. And it, it even goes up into like the, the icons, both painted and statuesque that the Christian traditions even still use to this day. So, you know, magical images, statues, and these are all essentially the same thing. There's different, you know, manners of making them. And, of course, each tradition, you know, a Catholic uh, church is going to work in one way as opposed to, like, the Solomonic Grim War, for instance. But they're all either physical objects to which an entity is bound, or when you're talking about, like, angels or deities, they're invited in, and it's kind of a place they can stand. 
Or in the case of like your painted icons, uh, the tradition there is that the saint or the angel will actually use that portrait as a window and they'll look through the eyes of the portrait to see what's going on on this side. It's just a way of solidifying and making concrete this relationship with the spirit and give the spirit a solid foundation to stand in our world and actually make change in it. That's very important, and that's something a lot of folks miss, is you can't just shout a spell out in the astral and expect the spirits to go make it happen, at least not as easily as if they have a solid foundation. You know, if you're, if you're going to use a lever, you've got to have a fulcrum point. You have to have solid ground to stand on, and it's the same for them, just in a more magical sense, I guess you could say. You also have referenced previously, Aaron, in this podcast and elsewhere, about the importance of psalms. And I know in Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, you, you reference that a lot. What is psalm magic, and how does one use or integrate psalms into the grimoires, especially if it might not be directly referenced, but maybe it could be very beneficial to a practitioner? Well, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a Solomonic grimoire that doesn't mention the psalms, because most of what you do is really packed with them. It's not just the psalms. It really works for any scripture. So, I mean, the book of Proverbs is great. When we're working with Aniel, the Archangel of Venus, uh, my wife and I will both go in and read, we'll hand the Bible back and forth and read the male and female uh, aspects of the entire Song of Solomon. Venus spirits love that one. But it's kind of a, a sympathetic magic. Once you establish, and this is important, you have to establish a relationship with these entities, which is why this first course is focused on that. And once you have their friendship and you have their attention and they have an actual reason to care what happens to, you know, the silly monkey that you that we all are. The Psalms are the Western form of invocations or incantations that are meant to make contact with the, the spirit. You know, like for instance, in Abramelin, in the French version, it's missing. I wouldn't say it's missing, it was added, but it is not apparent in the German version. There's no mention of this. But whoever made the French translation of the book of Abramelin wanted to add in what he knew of psalm magic. So there's certain places in the text where he said, say this psalm, say this psalm, now say these two psalms. It really added something. And he teaches, and because it was the only text available at the time, that's obviously what I've done, is when I go to my guardian angel's altar, as I'm unwrapping the silver lawman so I can actually communicate with her through that, I'm actually reciting Psalm 138. And I've been reciting that psalm every time I go into the, my oratory to work on that altar for, you know, now for decades. And so it has become a link. As soon as I walk in there and start that psalm, she wakes up. She knows that this is the ritual. This is how I call her. This is the protocol I follow. And she comes. So it's something that kind of builds over time. I kind of talk about it in the courses, you know, spiritual authority, having relationships with the entities that they know to come when you call and how you call them. And having said all of that, psalm magic, and this is what they call mixed Kabbalah, by the way, it's really like it's simple witchcraft, but in the biblical tradition. If you go back to one of the oldest versions of this, which is uh, Godfrey Selig's use of the psalms, he has all 150 psalms listed. And he has used Kabbalistic techniques to decide, to actually decipher names of God from that psalm. And he has little prayers in there. So if you want, uh, let's say, to protect your wife in childbirth, you would stand over a bed and you would say this particular psalm because that's good for childbirth. And then there would be a prayer at the bottom that you would add, which would call on God and those specific names that he decoded. Then you would say that further prayer for protection of your wife. And everything's like that. If you need money to do well in business, it's just like any other grimoire, really. It's day-to-day -day things that you need, and it just says, use this psalm. Or say this psalm over a bowl of milk and then pour honey into it and mix it up and then drink it, you know. And it's all very old, very witchcraft, folklore kind of magic, but it's all based on biblical scripture and invocations to, to the biblical God. And to that point, you also talk about devotional magic and creating your own devotions. And for me personally, it was really beneficial because when I was first kind of learning the planetary associations and the specific attributes of the planets, the archangels, the even going into the Kabbalistic sphere and the specific zodiacal signs, like it was so great because you kind of laid out that you can create your own 
devotions. Can you share with the listeners, like, what is devotional magic and what are some of the key elements that you can draw upon to kind of build your own devotions? See, in the previous class, I gave you your first actual practical magic because that's where I'm talking about mixed Kabbalah and folk magic and then just basic witchcraft type stuff. You, you would even find it very familiar. And the spell I give you for working is a very basic candle spell, uh, very similar to uh, the, what you, uh, the instructions I give in the uh, spell kits that we sell on Doc Solomon's. You know, you just figure out which entity you want to work with, and you have all the right colors and waters and correspondences and incense and oils and all that neat stuff. And, there's, you know, you can cast little folk spells that way. But then in class eight is where I really get into uh, drawing on everything that you learned, especially in the earlier classes, about setting up the altars. Deciding, okay, I want a relationship with this angel, you know. I kind of keep it limited to the seven, but, I mean, some of the students actually do have other angels that they build relationships with. And so, you know, putting together their altar, making sure all of its correspondences and colors are done correctly, what you can offer to the entity, how to handle those offerings and dispose of them after they're done. And but the whole thing is... It's not just, hey, I need some money, so let me do this, you know, like this candle, like the folk spells are. This is, okay, I want to build a relationship with you. I want you to be a member of my family in my house permanently. Like I said earlier when I mentioned house gods, you know, this now becomes a genius, a you demon, a good spirit in your house. And so I stress this too. I actually say this in Secrets of a Magical Grimoire. So I even knew this long ago that, you know, all this stuff you read in the grimoires, all this complex stuff and all these purifications and invocations and confessions and, and different tools that you need to do different things, all of that is just your way in. That's why they're called keys. It's the key of Solomon. It's, this is how you build the key to open the door. Once you, let's just pick Michael, you know, you've done all of these ceremonies and rituals and purifications to call upon Michael and now you've introduced yourself. And by following all the protocols, you've let him know that he's somebody that, you know, he, hey, maybe this person deserves some kind of respect. And then you put up this altar to him and you put all this stuff on it and you invite him into, there's even a ritual to invite the, I, I don't think I go over it so much in this class, but there, I do use a, an offering ritual to call the entity into his icon. So now Michael literally lives here. You know, it's, it's kind of my own little spark of Michael. You know, Michael the Archangel is still out there. But he can stop in here anytime, or you can think of him as a smaller Michael, a lesser Michael that lives here in this house. And rather than doing all the spells and conjurations that are in the grimoires, now I can just go right up to his altar and just say, hey, Mike, <laughs> you know, how's it, go, how's it going today? Here's what I need. Here's what, you know, here's what the offerings we're going to make. And, and of course, I do so much for clients. So I'm usually making a candle offering on their behalf and, and I'll tell them what their petition is, and I'll ask him to go and argue in the divine court on their behalf and to intercede for them. So all of this is devotional magic. It's creating a relationship with an entity on a, it's true gnosis, gnosis in the biblical sense, knowledge in the biblical sense, an intimate relationship with this being so that you're actually friends. And then that's, you do your magic that way. And that's where the really powerful stuff happens. That's all laid out in the eighth class. And then I hate to jump the gun, but the 102 material that, yes, I am actually putting together now, it actually begins not with Goetia. The very first class is going to be about taking everything you learned about devotional magic and focusing it in on a guardian angel. I'll talk about Abramelin in that class, but in the first class, I'm going to, since I have a whole course on Abramelin and who and what the holy guardian angel is, instead, in this first class, I'm going to focus more on your nativity guardian angel, the one who's actually in charge of your birth chart and your fate here on earth. And so you'll be able to start using that devotion to work with that particular angel. And from there, we'll go. Now, once you have an established contact up in the celestial that can, you know, fight for you and, and stop you from burning yourself too bad when he deems it necessary, then we'll move into the, the more chthonic stuff and the goetia and, and actually commanding spirits and such. Is there anything else, Aaron, that, that we haven't covered that you just like to let the listeners know about either the basics of Solomonic magic or about the course? The best advice I can give is to take the course. I, I do meet a lot of people with questions, 
And I do my best to answer questions. You know, if anyone asks me just an honest and obviously, you know, they're obviously sincere, a sincere question. But the problem I run into is some questions require me to explain other things first. And sometimes those things might require me to explain something else first. (laughs) And in many ways, that kind of guided my the way I put these classes together. What you want to know is how to do the stuff in class seven and eight. That's your end goal, really, for taking this class, that you have these this connection to these entities and you can call on them and make stuff happen in your life. That's I understand that completely. But I cannot teach you or really in-depth answer your questions on either the those topics with the folk magic or the devotional magic unless you first go through all of the history, unless you understand the lore of the angels, unless you understand how to put together your tools, unless you understand how to make the basic talismans you'll need to see. So the best advice I have, and I hate this, I don't want this to sound self-serving at all, but it is honestly my best advice is join the classes because it's going to start from scratch. It's not going to assume you know anything. This is not Kabbalah. This is not Golden Dawn. Uh, None of that stuff is in here. You're going to learn how they would have viewed these texts in the medieval era, and I'm going to explain, and and it it all layers on. Each thing layers on to the thing before it. So by the time you're done with this class, and I will say this too, you don't have to be interested in the Solomonic Grimoires either. If you're practicing a different tradition, still take this class because it's the very basis of how magic works, and I mean universally. This isn't about the Norse tradition versus the Celtic tradition versus the Hebrew tradition versus this day. This is about how you approach spirits, how you gain their trust, how you gain their respect, and how you gain their friendship. That's the same the world over. All magic systems are based on that. Everything from that point is cultural, and it's what that culture spirits wanted at that particular time. And by taking this course, even if you never touch a Solomonic Grimoire and you're just working in your own tradition, but then especially if you're going to go into the Solomonic Grimoires, you'll have an understanding of those basics of how magic works and how the protocols work. And you'll be able to progress further in what you're trying to accomplish with those particular entities. Aaron, just kind of switching gears a little bit to that point, you also have a class that kind of talks about the Book of Abramelin and really goes in depth. Can you just share with the listeners who might not be too familiar, what is the Book of Abramelin, the basics of the Book of Abramelin itself, and then can you talk about like the genesis of the class too? The basics of the book, I'll try try not to go on too long, but if I can boil it straight down, it is a story Fictional or not, we don't know, but it contains the story at the very beginning of a man named Abraham of Worms, and of course he lived in Germany, and he went out on a quest. He was also called Abraham the Jew. He was a Jewish man, and he had learned everything that he could from his rabbis. He had learned everything he could from everyone he knew, but he felt that something was missing. There was more that they obviously didn't know. So he went out looking for it. It's kind of an old classic tale. You know, Christian Rosencruz did the same thing. And, you know, many spiritual people go out wondering and trying to find the truth. As is very cliche with this kind of story now, he visits place after place, master after master. And he's like, yeah, they could pull off a couple of things, but they still, this, this, no, these, these guys don't really have what I'm looking for. And he finally, in Egypt, and in fact, he's just about ready to give up his quest. He's like, I've gone everywhere I can think to go. I've met no one that really impresses me. So he's ready to go home. And it's at the last minute. It's like a cliffhanger. <laughs> it's at the very last minute. Someone tells him about this old crazy dude named Abramelin that lives out in the desert in Egypt. So he decides to give it one last shot before he goes home. And he's led out to this place. And he finds this old hermit named Abramelin living out there. And Abramelin presents him a system of magic and the way it was presented to Abraham and the way, you know, going, he didn't actually go through the Abramelin, uh, what's in the Abramelin book there, but he had to go through all sorts of fasting and praying and confession and all sorts of stuff. And it just struck him that, no, this guy knows what he's doing. This guy is really reaching up toward the highest God, not just doing magic tricks, not just using science and calling it magic, you know, no fakerism involved. So he really accepted Abramelin as a true master. So he got his system of magic from him in, in manuscript form. He actually wrote it down 
actually not only did Abraham copy the manuscript from Abermellon, but he also filled it with a, this story right at the beginning. And then the rest of the book is filled with his commentary and his advice having gone through the operation. And what this operation was that he got from Abermellon, and he took that back home to Worms and performed it there. Uh, but the operation was originally, it was an 18 month long operation. The French version, which came later, shortened it to six months. And that's the one I performed because, as I said, that was the only version available at the time. This was long before uh, George Den and Stephen Guth published, translated and published the original German one. But it was originally 18 months. So you were there for a year and a half. It's a very Jewish system. I mean, you actually set up a, a what's called a Sukkot uh, tabernacle. It's usually called an oratory in the book of Abermelon. And you're going in and out of this little tent, this oratory, multiple times a day for months, just praying and praying and confessing and praying. You're not allowed to use any other kind of magic. You have to give up all of, everything else. And you can keep practicing your religion, but you have to do it outside of that oratory. You don't, if you're Christian, you don't bring in crosses. If you're Jewish, you don't bring in the stars of David and decorate. And, no, this is, there's nothing in this room but your altar and a lamp, and a sensor, and that's it. And everything else has to happen between you and the highest, and you have to just keep reaching out month after month for this. And it is a spiritual ordeal. This is, the, this is exactly what was happening to the old crazy shamans that would just go disappear in the desert, and then they would come back preaching new religions. I mean, that's what St. John the Baptist did. He was one of those crazy desert guys, you know? <laughs> they would bring back these new teachings that they had gotten from these angels because they had secluded themselves for so long, and fasted and prayed and and that's what this is this is literally an explanation of how to do that a lot of people unfortunately think that it's really just a really long evocation of an angel you know your guardian angel appears to you at the end even the book describes it in a very unfortunate manner that oh you're going to be able to ask the angel anything you want and the angel's going to tell you everything you've done right and everything you've done wrong and how to do everything better yeah, that happens, but it's not in that one session. It's not bring a notebook because he's going to teach you all of this. This is yet another. This is a bonding. But as opposed to these other altars with the archangels that we were talking about before, in this case, it's a crowning. It's a ritual possession. Your guardian angel actually moves in and becomes part of you and then begins to start guiding you. And it becomes your primary teacher. It becomes your primary go-to for all of your magic. It becomes pretty much everything for you. And again, that doesn't mean, like I said earlier, your guardian angel may say, well, if you want to learn how to do this, go learn that system of magic or go get this book. A lot of people worry, oh my God, will I be trapped in the Abermullen system afterward? Not really. Once you've made contact with that guardian angel, the angel will lead you where you need to go to learn and what magic system you should use. Another big mistake people make is confusing the holy guardian angel with what I mentioned before, your nativity angel. That is... Through most literature in the Western world, even outside the Western world, when reference is made to your guardian angel, your guardian spirit, they're generally talking about this nativity angel. This is the angel who was assigned to you at birth and is in charge of every aspect of your chart, everything that happens to you. He's the little angel that sits on your right shoulder and whispers, hey, you know, don't steal that candy when you're five years old. His exact opposite is a demon who sits on your left shoulder and says, no, go ahead and take the candy, man. No one's going to know, you know. So this is all reference to these, what you can call the lesser guardian angel, but it's really the nativity angel and the associated uh, negative aspect. What's in the book of Abramelin is very different. The holy guardian angel isn't even really an angel, not by, he's not an angel like Michael or Gabriel or Raphael. He comes from an entirely different and higher place. It's not Kabbalistic because he doesn't come from any sphere of the tree of life. It's a very, very, and, and you got to remember that this crazy Abramelin guy was living out in the desert in Egypt, metaphorically here, but basically right down the street from where the Nag Hammadi texts were all dug up. So he was living right in Gnosticism Central. Everything in his text comes from a more Gnostic angle. So you're actually calling on something that's above the angels from outside of the created realm, nothing associated with the stars or the planets or any of that. And it's actually more you're calling the Holy Spirit. And your holy guardian angel is just one part, one little spark of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of sanctus. So this entity pretty much overrules everything. It is your direct connection right off the wheel of karma up to the highest divine source that can't be named. That is what you start following. And that is what gives you your spiritual authority to start working with 
either the demons in the Book of Abermelon or other grimoires, working with other angels. In many ways, you know, doing the Abermelon process, and, and again, it's not just an evocation. Once you do Abermelon, that, that launches the rest of your life. You, you will do Abermelon for the rest of your life, um, even if you learn other things as well. It's a relationship you'll keep up forever because you're always going to want this guardian angel with you to teach you and to guide you. So that's kind of the basis of the whole thing. It's a very spiritual thing. You know, there's no sigils involved in this. There are no special names of God. It just tells you to call him Adonai or Adonai Zabayoth, which is the Lord of hosts. But that's it. And there's no other formulas. Or there's no other symbolism. People so often want... Well, God, you know, I don't want to just sit there and pray. Can I just do an LBRP or can't I do the Rose Cross or the Starfire or can I bring in these other pictures or no, you can't do any of that because you're trying to appeal to something that's beyond the spheres. So there are no names. There are no, there's, there's no color. Everything's white. You know, there's no sigils. There's none of that. You're, you're bypassing all of that. And that's why the system tells you you can't do any of that stuff for these six months. You have to lay it all down and appeal to the absolute highest source of all. And if you do that correctly and you can stick to it, and it is an ordeal. I mean, people do tend to go a little loopy toward the end of it. I, I can tell you that. And I did myself as well. But if you can persevere and stick to it and stick to those prayers and you get to the final seven days, then you've got contact with your guardian angel and you can go forward and start commanding the spirits and getting their oaths. You actually turn to all the Catholic spirits in the very final days with your guardian angel at your side and you get oaths from them so they can never harm you again. And they actually have to serve you. They actually have to do what you say now. And so you should come out of it kind of a baby adept. It doesn't make you a master, but it's just the start. You now have the authority. And from that point forward, you and your angel will guide you and lead you and build that authority and teach you new things and teach you how to work with these different entities. And it's an extremely powerful thing to do. Having a head spirit, having something actually crowned to you like that is, is something that's kind of been missing in the Western tradition for a very long time. Even though there's hints of it throughout the literature, you know, saints are drawn with halos around their heads. Moses came down from the mountain with a Shekinah presence glowing from his head. When the Pentecost happened, you know, those people sealed themselves up in a room for nine days and they were prepared to fast and pray until it happened. It just happened to take nine days and flames appeared on their heads. So the West knows about head spirits, but the only time I had ever encountered them in all my studies was when I started talking to Ashani Lele, because that's a very big thing. That's being crowned. That's how you become a priest in their tradition is putting your Orisha to your head. I realized through talking to him that that's what the book of Abermelon was describing, was putting your holy guardian angel to your head. It literally makes you a priest and makes you somebody that these other spirits kind of have to listen to. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, because my memory might be totally off here, but one of the first times you were on the podcast, you mentioned, Aaron, that... The Book of Abermelon prescribes, you know, for this time period, there's, you know, morning, noon, evening prayers. But you worked at night at the time, so you kind of flipped flipped the prayer schedule around a little bit, right? And kind of worked it that way. Oh, no, no, sir, I did not. Oh, you did not? I, oh, okay. I worked, at, I, I worked at night, which was technically breaking a rule because you're actually supposed to stay up during the day, not be up at night. But that rule is also, it's, it's in the same paragraph. It's talking about don't go out and party all night. And at that time, there was no electricity, so there really was no job that was done at night. You know, So it's not talking about working at night. It's saying don't be a lazy slob and sleep all day and then get up in the evening and go out and party because that's not the life. You, you can't live that life and do this. But in my case, I did have to work at night. But I'll tell you what, I would come home from work and do my morning prayers, and then I would go sleep. But I had an alarm set, so I was up at noon, and I would shamble like a zombie into the oratory and say to my prayers, and then I would go back to sleep. And then I would get up, and it was almost time to go to work that night. So I'd you know, get ready, have dinner, do all that nice stuff, and then go say my prayers at sundown, and then I'd go to work. I stuck to the instructions in the book even though I had to make the concession that I didn't have any choice but to have a night job at the time. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I phrased the question very sloppily. I mean, of course you stuck to the prayers, but I remember you mentioned that. Like, you would do your morning prayer, 
and then just go right to bed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I didn't want the listeners to think that I just did my prayers at night, you know, at sunset, midnight, and sunrise. No, I did them at, the, at, at sunrise, noon, and sunset. But yeah, that meant I had to drag myself out of bed at what for me was like, would have been like a normal person doing it, you know, getting up at 4 (laughs) a.m. to go in and do their prayers. But for me, it was in the middle of the day. Yeah, exactly. Which to me even highlights, you know, more that dedication. And I mean, you are one of the few people that I've ever heard of that has completed, especially, you know, so many years ago, completing the actual Abramelin Rite. And can you tell us, Aaron, about the Abramelin Squares and how you actually kind of addressed the issue of missing squares or problematic squares? And in your past blog posts and and research, you've actually kind of rectified some of these issues with the magical squares. Can you share about this? Oh, yeah. Well, as I said before, we only relatively recently got the original German translation. All we had was the French. And looking at the two of them now, I can see exactly what happened. In the original German, there are no squares. You're told to make squares, and you're given the words to put in the squares, but they are not in square form. My natural inclination was to make up a bunch of grids and start filling them in so I could actually see what the squares looked like. That is apparently what the French author was doing as well, because he has all the grids laid out, and he has a few of them filled in, and then you'll notice as it goes on, some of them are only partially filled in, you know, and then some of them might only have one or two lines in them. And for generations, I mean, Aleister Crowley and Mathers were throwing back and forth demons at each other using mostly blank Abramelin squares. So, I mean, this has been going on for a very long time. But those squares are basically inert. They're not thin. That's not the whole square. Once we got the German original, uh, we saw that what happened in the French was he was trying to put them all into grid squares and work on them. And he apparently got a few of his own, too, because there are some that are uh, original to that manuscript. But he never completed the job. Something happened in his life, and he just lost track of it and never completed it. Once I got a hold of the German, like I said, my natural inclination was to do the same thing that French guy had done. And I started completing the squares. All kudos go to George Den and Stephen Guth for that. I mean, you know, I didn't, it's not like I went to my guardian angel and said, you know, give me the the completion of these squares. I mean, there would be no way for you or another person to know if those are legitimate or not. You know, I say I asked my guardian angel and this is what I got. But, you know, that kind of thing can be very fluid. This is absolutely me taking the the words that were given in Den and Guth's book and finally making them into square form. Now, the only thing is, once you start doing that, you notice that not all the words fit. Not all the squares actually come together the way they're supposed to. I found errors where a word might be spelled with an extra letter that shouldn't actually be in the square. You know, So if it's a six by six square, I might find one word in the list that was seven letters long, and I had to figure out which letter was appropriate to keep or get rid of. I found some squares that were upside down, you know, instead of the keyword being at the top and then the other words moving down the square, you had almost gibberish at the top and the keyword was at the bottom. And in those cases, I actually flipped them the exact same square, exact same letters and patterns and everything, but I corrected them to be upright. And that one, honestly, there's some wiggle room on that. There, there could be an argument that they were supposed to be upside down, but I went ahead and, and corrected them that way in, in my work. So once I had all that correction done, and then by the way, the correction wasn't just correcting their spelling, or which is kind of a weird thing because there isn't any correct spelling in the squares. Uh, like Hebrew words are just spell how they sound. It's, there's no um, standardization, and that's fine. That's how they work. So that even makes the job even a little harder because you, know, you never know how something was intended to be spelled. But as I was doing this, I was also looking up each word, and I was trying to find out what was actually in the squares and what they were saying. And, of course, a lot of them, the name of the spirit who does the work is there. Most of them are made up of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin words. And I think there might there's a couple I couldn't track down, so I suspect there's some Chaldean and maybe even Egyptian in there just here and there. But mostly Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. They are just words that pertain to whatever the talisman does. So there's one to get gold, and the name on it, is, the, the first word you see is the Hebrew Tifereth. It means beautiful and is often used to refer to beautiful gold jewelry. 
every word, Tifereth is the key word, and every other word on that talisman is supposed to relate to a gold ring, to this thing that you want. But it also has to fit into the square so that it reads the same across and downwards. <laughs> so each square is actually a puzzle. People see these and they think, oh, Sudoku, and they're joking that that's actually true. It's kind of a Western Sudoku. There's a long history of word games. Uh, old newspapers used to have them all the time. And the idea is to find words that fit whatever rules you have established. And there are rules for these word squares, some of which I've already said. And they all have to fit. So if I'm going to make a new square, I don't just get the square from my guardian angel. I might get the keyword. And then I have to go in and find other words in Hebrew, Greek, or Latin that will be the right length and the right spelling that it will fit into the puzzle. And by the time you do this, it's almost like a meditation because you're looking through all these dictionaries and all these different versions of words. The different versions of the words will sometimes have little, slightly different connotations, you know, in what they mean. It's the same thing, but maybe this one means a gold ring. Maybe this one means a pile of gold, you know, just that kind of thing. By the time you've built a square, you've learned something about that talisman, that magic, or the spirit, especially, that's going to be doing the work for you. They are puzzles, and they're meant to be puzzles, and they're meant for you to spend time meditating over them to try to put the effort into constructing a solid square that actually is balanced and works. And once you have that, then that becomes your main focus, and you, know, you would conjure whatever spirit, if it's named in the talisman or not, but you would conjure the spirit link to it. And now you have this thing to show the spirit that says, this is what I want you to do. The rest is like, you know, just magic. <laughs> you tell them what to go get and they go fetch it or do it or whatever they're supposed to do. Can you kind of share overall about this Abramelin class? Can you just talk about what was the genesis of the class? Was it similar to the secrets of the magical grimoires where you're like, hey, there's this text. In, in one case, it's your book. and in, in the other case, it's the book of Abramelin. And you felt like a class would really help answer a lot of these questions. And can you just give us an overview? Yeah, the genesis was, I was trying to think, you know, I had, I had pretty good success with the Solomonic 101 class, but I wanted to offer more than just that, you know. Abermelon is one of those topics that everyone wants to know more about it. There's a certain percentage of people who think they know all about it. Oh, it's so infuriating. I, I, I warn people when they start talking about Abermelon in one of my groups, I say, look, guys, I am going to get grumpy. And unless you have read the entire book more than once, not a requirement, but preferably you've actually done it and lived it, then I don't want to hear, see you posting your theories on what you think it is and who you think the guardian angel is. <laughs> Cause I just, Oh, I just want to go off. And I mean, if anything is a subject that needs things explained that need explained that need explained. I mean, this is it. Most people are shocked when they learn who and what the guardian angel is. You know, like I said, it's not even an angel. Angel is kind of a misnomer. It's something bigger. It's something more. So I decided that would be a really good place to focus my next teaching on, you know, instead of just having people think they're doing some big elongated evocation ceremony, I wanted to show them I do go into history, but it's not so much following a thread of history in this case, but just showing like, okay, here's the oratory. And like I said before, that's actually a sukkot. And most people don't realize that. And when you realize it's a Jewish sukkot, then you can look that up and, oh my God, there's all sorts of stuff to know about Jewish sukkot. So that's the kind of thing I teach. I teach that, I, number one, I do a lot of myth busting. This is what people say about Abermelon. Get it out of your head now. It's not true. It's got nothing to do with Abermelon. And I tell you what, I posted this just the other day. I think a lot of people just pick up the Mathers, the French version, his translation of the French version, what we call the Mathers version of the book of Abermelon. And he wrote an introduction for the book way back in the Victorian era. And I think a lot of people read that introduction and then they think they know what the book of Abermelon is, but they don't because Mathers didn't know what the book of Abermelon was. He was literally just taking wild stabs that intro. Well, this grimoire has this. Maybe this is something like that. Nor this grimoire has this. Well, maybe this is something like that, you know. So by the end of it, nothing's really answered. So I go in and I actually go over each part of the operation. I should point out also this is for practical use. 
you don't have to do the operation to take the classes, but it's intended for people who are taking it. So every tool, every ritual object is explained. That's where you get your history and why these things are in the book and what they mean. And then it's every month you're supposed to be doing the operation for at least a six month version, but I'll take students who want to do the longer ones too. And each class was originally given live uh, one month apart. So you were literally, I was coming in once a month into your life to tell you the next thing you need to know, the next thing you need to prepare for and lead you through the operation. Not like a guru, you know, but just as someone who's done it before. And here's what all this means. And and if they have any questions, of course, there's the group. So they can ask me specific questions about their circumstances. You know, well, what if the window isn't on this side? What if it's over here? What if I can't get a room with a window? What if I can't get a separate room at all? What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? It's a very complex subject. There's an entire class just dedicated, and I think it's about three hours long, just dedicated to exploring who and what the Holy Guardian Angel really is. One class is dedicated entirely on teaching you how to make the word square. So what I was saying before about the keywords and all of that, that's all gone into it is step-by-step detail in that class. And so it just leads you right up to the final seven days. In fact, I give one class that is just about meditation and how to properly scry. By the way, it has nothing to do with visualization. You don't visualize anything. There's actually a secret to scrying without visualization. I teach that in the class. You know, they should go from there uh, on into the seven days, which you have to do utterly alone. So they usually go out of contact for that period. Again, these are all recorded classes now, so they're not live anymore. You can come listen to them anytime you want. Uh, Some students come in because they want to do the operation maybe within the next year or two or more. And so they're taking the classes early so they can get all the info. And then once they do the operation, they can re-listen to them once a month if they want to and actually have a little more of a guided experience. That's the basics. And by the time you come out of this, I mean, just taking the class, let alone doing it, but if you just take the class and you come out of that last class, you'll have a better understanding of Abramelin than anything you will see posted online or on Facebook or talked about in a YouTube video. And in fact, it'll get to the point where it'll, you'll start getting grumpy over it. I've seen some of my students, especially the ones who went through the operation, they're coming out now and they're seeing a lot of, you know, you go into an Abermelon group and it's just like you want to bang your head against the, <laughs> against the desk with some of the stuff that's being said in there. So, yeah, it's going to completely change your outlook on how it works and how it's supposed to become a permanent part of your life that, you know, with you and your guardian angels connection. Another thing, too, is I'm writing two new classes for it. So, you know, if you're already in, you've already paid for them. But these poor people have been waiting for almost two years <laughs> for me to get these last classes done. But it's going to cover everything about how to work with the system after the months are done. Constantly working with your guardian angel for the rest of your life. How to actually work with the chthonic spirits and all those chiefs of hell that you summon and bind, you know, so that, so that now they have to do what you say is going to cover all that kind of stuff. So that's still upcoming. That's actually first on the list before anything else. <laughs> so Aaron, we do have some listener questions for you as well. Uh, we have a few listener questions from Bara Queen Bee and Bara is asking Aaron, her first question is what is your daily practice? Is there anything you can share with us there? I kind of guess that depends on how that question is meant. You know, as far as like a like a routine I go through, I don't really have one per se. Back when I was going up to the grades of the Golden Dawn, I had their thing. So there were daily exercises and stuff and the Western Hermetic stuff. So I have gone through that. But as far as the Solomonic stuff, there's not really much of a daily exercise except, and this has really increased tenfold since I opened up Doc Solomon's and started doing services and candle lightings and stuff for people. The main thing that I do is maintaining the guardian angel altar. So it's mainly on the Sabbath. So that's when I actually go in and do, I have to be there at, not noon, but I have to be there at dawn and dusk to open and close the altar for that day. I mean, I do a lot of work there. But anything else I do, whether it's Solomonic or not, it doesn't matter. If I'm going to go do a Golden Dawn ritual or if I'm going to go to temple, if I'm going to do a candle lighting, if I'm going to do a consecration in the Solomonic system, anything, I don't do anything without going in and opening that altar first. And this is why I say it's increased tenfold now that I do this for clients, too. So hardly a day goes by that I'm not in there in my oratory 
saying the prayers, the confessions, the praises, and then calling my angel and telling her to open the way and to be with me and to open my eyes and my ears so I can see and hear what she has to say or and or to bring the angel that I need to talk to to me. So this is always my first go-to, and this is a constant thing that happens, you know, like I said, almost every day. And again, increases a million-fold thanks to clients, but going and maintaining all of the house altars. We have seven altars here, one for each of the seven archangels. On the right, on their day and in their hour is when I will go and put petitions for clients. So it's very rare for me not to have a day where I'm going to be going and actually doing a full ritual opening. I mean, we don't just go up to the altar and set a light down and and say a prayer for you. There's actually a very, there's a method that we have to use to open the altar, to wake up the angel and say, hey, you know, we're about to do work, to consecrate the lights, to consecrate the coal for the incense, to do the conjuration for the angel itself. And then we put the petition before it and we dress the candle and we inscribe the client's name in it. And then we dress the candle and we burn it and we ask them, like I said previously, to intercede, to go into the divine court and argue on behalf of our client for whatever they need. It's a little more rare for me to have to go wake up Cassiel of Saturn, but I think he kind of likes it that way because he's Saturn and you know, he wants to be dark and quiet and left alone. Samael is, a lot of people are kind of afraid to approach him and the Martian energy. So it's a little more rare for us to get to work for him. But then sometimes it'll come in spurts. You know, people will need help with bravery, courage, uh, protection from someone who's trying to hurt them. But we do a lot, a lot of work with Yophiel and Sakiel, who are both the angels of Jupiter. We do work with Michael a lot. Gabriel less so than them of the moon, which kind of surprises me. Because so many people are into lunar magic and stuff, but we we don't tend to have to pester Gabriel much. And, of course, Aniel, the angel of Venus, that's the other one that's really big. Basically, Jupiter, which is where you get prosperity and fortune, and, you know, Venus, where you get love and sex. Those are the two most (laughs) most of our clients are asking about all the time. (laughs) But one way or another, we do have, it kind of becomes a daily thing. But like I said, some more than others, for us to go and open those altars and invoke their energies and make prayers to them. Well, I would say that's pretty much the the big thing for the daily practice. So it's always going to have what I do. My Abermelon practices are always central. Whichever day it happens to be will generally determine who we're working with. Oh, and I forgot Raphael as well. Raphael's the third big one. He, a lot of people just need to know things or they need help with institutions or with education or with travel, anything that Mercury governs. So I actually a lot of intercession candles for clients at his altar too. The next question from Bara Queen Bee actually ties into that, which is she's asking, what is the biggest change that influenced your magical practice in the most positive way? I would definitely have to say that before all that, Ashani Lele was what really radically changed my practice and my worldview without a doubt, performing Abermelon. One question I get about Abermelon very often is after Abermelon, in the book, Abraham says that when he completed it, the old magical secrets he knew and techniques he knew ceased working. And he, had, he was kind of stuck with the Abermelon thing. In my experience, it's not that what I knew before ceased working. It's that a lot of it, which was kind of a system I had put together myself up to that point, just kind of fell away and seemed in unnecessary. And the parts that were really good and really worked, I came to understand and use them all so much better. So Abermelon is definitely the big, a big, huge turning point. Once I got my Holy Guardian Angel as a teacher, everything changed. But again, setting up Doc Sauls, same thing. Doing magic for yourself is one thing. And it also kind of encourages you to cut corners and to do things a little more informally. But setting up Doc Sauls and offering services, I'm very strict on, you know, this is what more say, this is what you're paying me to do. So I'm going to do it on the right day and the right hour with the right conjurations, the right methods. And not only is it making me do more in that sense, but it's also making me do more of it. So like I said, hardly a day goes by that I'm not opening up a planetary altar to commune with those angels and maintain their altar and make offerings to them. Just having to serve my fellow men and women and work on their behalf has been, like, astounding. I almost feel like I didn't really understand anything about magic until I became 
someone who does it for other people. When people, you know, are in trouble, when they're scared, when they're upset, and they come to you and say, you know, help, and I can intercede for them and actually make things better for them. And that is just, I mean, that is, that's a revelation. I can't even describe how big that is. Those are the points where I had the most change. You know, there were other points as well, like meeting uh, the Ciceros and starting to work with them. I mean, I would not understand the Golden Dawn or (laughs) any of that side of things at all if I hadn't been under their tutelage and actually gone through the system and earned the grade that I currently hold and even just working in a group. I mean, forget that it's Chick and Tabitha who are just like the best teachers you could possibly have in that tradition. But I had always been solitary, so just learning how to work as part of a group and let some of my own opinions go sometimes so that I could harmonize with the group better. But at the same time, bringing what I knew and making changes that other people adopt. And, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, a group dynamic is different, and you learn a lot by doing that. And I think that also helped me in being able to work for clients and other people and what they need done and what they expect to have done as well. So those are the big game changers for me in, in my path. There's another question from Bara for you, Aaron, which is, what is your relationship with money? And I know in past podcast episodes, you've mentioned things like, you know, people ask spirits or want to do operations for money, but they won't get out and get a job first and actually make their life magically enchantable. Or, you know, I'm thinking of the book of Abramelin, where someone is is asking for an amount of money that's not crazy, extravagant, billions and billions of dollars, but it's enough in the book of Abramelin to live comfortably for the rest of your life. So, I'm not trying to speak for Bara, but Bara is just asking, what is your relationship with money and finances and all that? Well, I'm a Capricorn, so I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with money. (laughs) I hate the bad things that it does and can lead to. I hate that we have to have these stupid little green tickets or else we starve and live on the street. That, that That should not be... But that Capricorn, I do like doing business. I love running Doc Solomon's, and I love making the invoices and make setting up payments for people if they can't pay for the classes all at once. Cause we, you know, we do that and coming up with new ideas to grow the business. I get off on all that. So I'm having a blast doing all of that, but it's interesting. You brought up the, uh, the Abermelon thing. Cause that's really the center of it for me too, is what's really being said in the book of Abermelon, you know, enough money to be comfortable the rest of my life. But what you're really asking when you put that before your guardian angel is I need the resources to do the job that I was put here to do for the rest of my life. Once you ask your guardian angel for that, it's not, you know, I'm not going to hand you over a bag of money, big check from the publishers clearing house sweepstakes. Hey, does anyone remember them? It's not going to show up at your door. You know, you're not going to be driving behind an armored truck and it hits a bump and boom, you know, you, you got money all in your lap. But what's going to happen is your guardian angel is then going to lead you through the next several years to put you rightfully so, in the place you're supposed to be, doing the job, enacting the office that you have been appointed to as an initiate. You know, and in my case, it was to to run this store, to write my books, to be a teacher. Here at Solomon Springs, you know, we were about to start hosting uh, large-scale uh, pagan festivals. To do this, to be a priest as I am, and to perform those duties and the counseling and the intercessions with the candle offerings and other services that we do and all of this together, I needed resources to do that. But at the time when I asked my guardian angel, because you can only ask once, I didn't know what I was going to (laughs) do. I had no idea all this was coming. I was just a stupid kid. But I just said, I just said that I need the resources to do what it is you, you want me to do. And sure enough, they've all come and I have exactly what I need to do. And I'm not rich. Not one cent, I think, was ever given to me that I didn't need, you know, just to have go and have fun with. You know, it's always this is what you need to get this job done. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, the property we need is is, is manifested. It took years. It took decades. But the property and the house and the business and everything that we're doing today has all stemmed from that. The resources that we have at our disposal to do those things has always just come. This is one of those places, and I'm going to shock your listeners who know me, but I'm actually going to agree with Crowley on something. Alistair Crowley said, if you are not following your true will, then you are fighting the inertia of the universe. You are moving in a direction 
that the universe didn't have marked out for you, so you're going to slog through for your, your entire life. But if you can come to understand your true will and follow that, then you'll have the inertia of the entire universe behind you, and there is no force in the universe that can stop you. That's what this is. By doing Avermelon and saying, okay, you have work for me. Bring me what I need to do the work and show me what the work is. And boy, has she on both counts. That's my relationship with money. It's, it wasn't about asking for an amount, and it sure wasn't about asking to be rich. This is something I talk about a lot. Maybe there's another question that this will this will kind of blend into. I don't know. Because uh, once money is brought up, it, it usually goes to, well, if you're a magician, why aren't you rich? Why don't why can't you just conjure up money when you want to go play? You know, I always say it's if you understand money, then you would understand why that question makes no sense. Because even if I could conjure up a million dollars. If I'm not a businessman and I don't know how to invest it and make it grow, and that means sacrificing a portion of my life to work for that money. I don't mean work to earn the money. I mean literally be the, the money's employee. You have to maintain it. You have to make sure it keeps growing because if you don't, it just drains away. And how many stories have you heard of lottery winners that are broke and suicidal within a year or two? Because... If you get a windfall, that stuff will flow right back out like the tide, I promise you. Unless you are the kind of person, an entrepreneur, and business savvy, and know what to do with that money. And so your average occultist is not studying how to be a business mogul. Your average occultist is studying how to be an occultist. <laughs> and I'm the same way. I, I'm running my business, and I'm really loving it, but this is my first experience with, with having a business. I can't expect everyone who learns magic to go set up their own online shop and run a business. It is difficult and you kind of have to be wired for it. So the fact that they don't just automatically have money because they know magic, that doesn't mean anything. I know Jason Miller and others talk about like making your life magically enchantable first in some way. So instead of saying, give me the winning lottery numbers, it's like, hold on. If you've already worked to make your life somewhat magically enchantable or the potential of enchantment in the first place, like you have an online business or you're an author, you can then ask for much more specific things like, I would like to grow the number of sales for my book by 20% in the next three months or whatever it is. You know, It's much more specific than just, give me the oh, winning yeah. lottery numbers. <laughs> Right. And that that's another thing people do miss is, yes, they kind of look at it like, you know, fairy tale magic. Well, again, you should be able to wave a wand and a bag of money should fall in your lap. But this is something I, I said on Facebook very recently. I made a post and I said, stop looking at the spirits you work with as genies. Yeah, they are genies, but as television style or movie style genies that just grant your wishes. Instead, you need to look at them as an army of allies that you have on the other side who walk with you and make your efforts more successful. You can't just wish for it to come in. You have to be able to go out there. You have to have a plan. You have to know what you want to do. And then you can ask them, all right, let's make this happen. Let's make me successful at this. You know, I'm going to open up an online business. Yeah, well, you and especially in a cult business. Yeah, well, you and 100,000 other people, you know, OK, but I'm going to open this business and I want you spirits to bring me customers. I want you spirits to make my name greater and then make the ads more effective and make, you know, and give me ideas for product. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on, but it was all, it's all the foundation of, yeah, you already have a plan that you're going to do this thing and then they can help you do it. So Aaron, we do have a listener question. Speaking of Aleister Crowley from John Siraki, who's asking, quote, I know that many magicians bristle at the mention of Aleister Crowley these days, but I was wondering if you, Aaron, could provide your perspective on his Enochian work, specifically Lieber 418, The Vision and the Voice, since it is probably the most extensive modern work with the Enochian Aethers, specifically the instructions in Aether 8, that provide a method for attaining to the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. The first thing, the most important thing, is that what I practice as Anakian and what Crowley practices as Anakian are really two different traditions. In my Anakian books, I actually explain this and, and it's, I follow the history of how one became the other. But after Dee passed away, his journals came into other people's hands. 
and but not all of them. They had actually been split up. Some were buried on his property. Others were in a secret, the secret bottom of a chest that went around Europe for quite some time before uh, it was discovered that there were papers hidden in the bottom. A lot of these are I say these original guys. I'm talking about like for our modern traditions, the founders of the Golden Dawn, uh, even Alephus Levi, who they drew a lot from. These guys are all kind of a new breed of a magician. They weren't like the old, very shamanic minded occultists that wrote the Grim Wars. They were more, they were members of Masonic orders and they were, you know, that, you know, it was a very different mindset. And also this is where the, where psychology was just being invented. Dr. Mesmer, you know, was, was alive during some of this, this period. They were trying to rescue magic by rationalizing it. And that's where this, the idea that it's all psychological came from. And well, they're not really demons from hell. Don't be afraid. It's just names for different parts of your subconscious. And yeah, you open them up and it's scary, but you know, it's not really demons. And I blame Crowley for that. I blame Mathers for that. I blame Rigardi for that. They started a new trend that continues to this day, though it's starting to break up and the old magic is kind of coming back now. Uh, but for a long time, magic was just a form of psychology. And if you believed in anything other than you were a deluded, superstitious idiot. <laughs> and that's what it was like for me back in the days when I really started delving into the Grim Wars and seeing their reality. And, and I would get some blowback like that from time to time. Now we get to the Golden Dawn and they are getting their hands on what they could of these journals. And you've seen True and Faithful Relation. That's what most of them were using. It's huge. I mean, it's a huge book and it's thick on top of that. And it's a lot of writing that's hard to read. It's being written in early modern English, which is the same thing Shakespeare was writing. in. so if you've ever tried to read a Shakespeare play, that's what it's like trying to read this dense tome of these journals. So they really did their best to try to ferret out what they considered the best of those journals. Because some of the journals were missing, they thought there wasn't a complete magic system there. They thought it was just a skeletal frame. So the Golden Dawn especially took like the watchtowers and they took the 48 calls and they took this stuff out of these journals and then they plugged them into their system of magic. And by doing that, a lot was changed. A lot of the original context was gone and Golden Dawn Anakian, which I call neo Anakian, this being the neo Anakian tradition. That still exists today. There's a lot of people who study Golden Dawn and Thelemic material uh, because Crowley learned Anakian from the Golden Dawn. So he just continued that. His Anakian material is neo Anakian, which really isn't my forte. I'm not a big fan of it, even though I'm in the Golden Dawn and I, you know, I have to pass tests on it and everything too. It's just not my specialty. I don't really pay much attention to it. I practice the deep purist material because once we had all of his journals, and especially once, you know, we got all of his journals years before the internet, but we finally got the internet. So we had all the documents and we had a globe full of people who were completely obsessed with this stuff all in, you know, one group back then it was called a Nokia L. So this was before the modern internet. This was internet 1.0. And this was just a mailing list. Uh, it would show up in your email inbox with a ton of CCs on it. So, you know, it was like that. And we all just sat there on this list and just deciphered every word, every page, every point of punctuation in these journals. And we figured out the original system and the entire, and it is a complete magical system of the actually fairly typical Renaissance angel magic. So that's what I publish and that's what I practice. So if you ask me about Crowley's vision in the voice, it is completely irrelevant to my Anakian practice. I'm also not a big fan of Crowley where it comes to Abramelin, because this is a man who says he performed Abramelin while riding on horseback with a friend through the desert, but that he didn't complete it. And he went back years later and completed it. And that is so not how Abramelin works. <laughs> I mean, it is not even slightly. I mean, and I do know from his, his stories of it that he was adding in his own rituals for it and doing all sorts of wacky stuff that has literally nothing to do with Abermelon. So the vision of the voice and his interpretation of the ethers is at best the Golden Dawn's interpretation, which is not my tradition. That was not the, the Enochian tradition that I follow. And I pretty much discount almost anything he has to say about Abermelon or the Holy Guardian Angel, because 
That's just something he didn't have a clue about. Like I said, he and Mathers were actually trying to use mostly blank Abramellon squares to throw demons back and forth at each other. So these guys just did not understand the material and not entirely through their own fault. I mean, this is late 18 and early 1900s. They couldn't just go to Google, you know, or go to Wikipedia or, or, or look up Aaron Leach's, you know, <laughs> website or, or go ask him questions on Facebook. So, None of the resources that we have today and all the authors that we have today that understand the system better, you know, not just me, but there's others out there, too. There's just no comparison between now and then. I mean, what what Crowley and even the early Golden Dawn really understood about Anakin Magic was very basic at best. That ties into a follow-up question from John C. Racky saying... I listened to Aaron's interview on Balthazar Conjure's podcast, and Aaron stated that his HGA pushed him towards Golden Dawn work. And then John says, I'm not sure that pushed is the exact word he used, but John says groups such as the Golden Dawn and the AA divide the experience of the HGA into the vision of the HGA, which comes well before the knowledge and conversation. So John's asking, does the grade work of these Kabbalistic yogic organizations shape this relationship? And does Aaron see this as something that a person can accomplish independent of such groups? The first thing I have to point out, I know there's a lot of Holy Guardian Angel stuff in Salima because Crowley was very into that. And like I said, I don't have the highest opinion of his understanding of the system. Now, with the Golden Dawn, there is no Holy Guardian Angel in the Golden Dawn system. Not outer order, not inner order. It's just something they never mentioned. In the very early order, they didn't really have a second order. The second order came along later, and in its earliest days, there was really no material for it other than the initiations. So what adepts did in those days, and you go through the outer order, which was the school, and then that school was supposed to prepare you to go get the old grimoires and use those. And that's what Mathers and Crowley and Westcott and all those guys were using were the grimoires. And that's why Mathers and Crowley were sending Abermelon squares back and forth at each other. And, and that's why Mathers was trying to defeat his enemies by representing them as peas and sifting them through a strainer. And all, this is all old grimoire stuff they were using. In the Golden Dawn, there really was no Holy Guardian Angel at all. In the Neophyte, one of the uh, officers, the hegemon, this is the officer that actually you are blindfolded and you have a rope tied around you. You are being led blindly through most of the, of the ritual, very much like a Masonic initiation. And uh, the hegemon represents your higher and divine genius. This is your higher self, what they call in the Kabbalah, your neshama, the part of you that's kind of still in heaven waiting for you to return, your true soulmate. But the hegemon kind of attracts that force down and embodies it for on behalf of the candidate. This is why in the zero zero, an officer will like demand uh, to know the answer to a question or something from the candidate. You know, you cannot go past me unless you know my name. And then the hegemon will respond because the hegemon is representing the higher and divine genius of that person. But the thing is your higher and divine genius is not your holy guardian angel. And a lot of literature that came from the Golden Dawn, that came from members of the Golden Dawn in the years that followed, including Crowley, including Rigardi, they would conflate these two. They would just refer to your higher self, your higher and divine genius, as your holy guardian angel. And this is one of the myths I bust in my Abermellon classes. It's not the same thing. If there is an analog in the zero zero right to your holy guardian angel, it's the Hierophant who sits in the East. And then when you're brought to the altar, he comes right down that middle path and blasts everything out of the way and initiates you. That's your holy guardian angel. He's the solar force in the temple. Your higher and divine genius is an entirely separate entity. I often say that the holy guardian angel is the redeemer, the savior, the thing that comes down separate from you to smack you around a little bit and go, hey, this is not where you're from. You need to come home and then starts guiding you. There is nothing in the Golden Dawn that is going to get you in touch with your Holy Guardian Angel. The only way to do that, there's a caveat here. I'm going to say the only way to do that in the Western tradition that we have now is Abramelin. And I'm not saying that Abramelin is some kind of God text that everyone has to follow. But what I am saying is that as I've researched other traditions throughout history, whether they're Christian, Jewish, pagan, ancient witch doctor natives, 
It's been the same formula throughout all this time by which a person becomes an initiate, becomes crowned, has the knowledge and the conversation. Again, knowledge in the biblical sense. You're marrying this entity and having an open line of communication with a guardian angel. Whether it's a guardian angel, whether it's an Arisha in Lakshmi, whether it's you know one of the Greek deities and the old Greek religions, but the process, the basic process of going into seclusion, fasting, praying, letting go of everything else, that is the only way that you will get in contact with this other being called your holy guardian angel. What's good about the Golden Dawn is it's a great training program. It can get you using the magic, get you used to the forces. And you know, I did Avermelon first. And then my guardian angel said, hey, you live two hours from the Cicero's. Why have you not gone over and said hi? So I did. (laughs) There were some other circumstances that actually got me and Chick into contact with each other. But I said, this is an opportunity. I got to go meet them. And the rest, I just was just history. I just love those guys. I love Chick and Tabitha. I love the way they run their organization. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And those people are those two. And my temple and my order, they are my family. And they're one of the best things that ever happened to me. I understand why my guardian sent me there. But I didn't need that to contact her the first time. And you don't need to go through their system in order to meet your holy guardian angel. So it's kind of an apples and oranges kind of thing. Aaron, we have an anonymous question from one of our listeners who says, I have an honest question for Aaron, and I have the utmost respect and love for him. I note in the Solomonic group, Aaron sometimes tends to overly criticize Aleister Crowley and Thelema, and yet he's featured in the upcoming book, Ceremonial Magic, by David Shoemaker, and featuring Lon Milo Duquette, which is truly Thelemic. So my question is, can Aaron share about the line between criticizing an esoteric approach like Thelema and then also partners in upcoming publications. What advice do you, Aaron, have for magicians who maybe are part of one tradition, but they also want to dialogue with other traditions that we might criticize? Building bridges thing is is kind of a, a difficult thing. You know, when I first started learning all this stuff, I mean, when I was still reading Don Craig's book and learning the Kabbalah and stuff, and I was like still in college, There was a neo-pagan kind of uh, fad going on at the time, a lot of rapid growth in the tradition, and there was a lot of hard feelings and bigotry against anything even remotely biblical. If you're going to hang around with neo-pagans at the time, you kind of had to keep your Kabbalistic studies quiet, or you just had to be honest about it and take the abuse. (laughs) And in different situations, I've chosen both. So, But it was a very hard time, and I don't know really what to say a lot about trying to bridge those gaps when they exist. I can say that, thankfully, over the years, that division has broken down a lot. I mean, I've gone to Florida Pagan Gathering and given well-attended lectures about biblical subjects, or I've actually pulled out my Bible and started reading passages from it at a pagan event. I could never have gotten away with that in the 90s. So those walls just seem to kind of naturally dissolve. But here's here's my real answer to the entire subject. The people that are fighting with each other, the people that are, my tradition is better than yours. And a lot of people are going to shake their head and say, hey, you're being a hypocrite here. But I'm really not. When people are saying that, you know, my system is better than yours and I'm the only one that knows the real way to do this, those people aren't really the people you're trying to build connections with. You're not trying to bridge with them because... They're kind of ignorant in the first place. They're already closed off. All you want is less people like that. You're not going to reach those people. You just don't want more of them to come along, really. So that little by little, just like has happened with me, with Grimoires and Kabbalah and Golden Dawn, and pagans are interested in it. I have pagans that come to my masses and take the Eucharist. I mean, and, and they think it's beautiful because all religions and all traditions have some ray of the truth in them. It is not anyone's place to say that this tradition is the real truth. You're either, you're either doing it the Golden Dawn way or you're crazy or you're an idiot, you know? And I've heard people say that. That's not the way it is. And even though sometimes I get a reputation for saying similar things, that's not what I'm saying when I'm ranting about magic. 
when I'm ranting about chaos magicians, when I'm ranting about Thelema, there just happen to be things in those traditions I do disagree with, and I will I will say them. I'm not afraid to say them out loud. Thelemites have had much thicker skins about it. Chaos magicians tend to get really <laughs> angry and want to fight over it. So I've had to make a promise to my followers that I won't get into fights with people over these things. But that's not the same as saying my tradition is better than yours. You have to practice my tradition or else you're a fake. But at the same time, and I'm repeating myself here from an earlier part of this conversation when I said that it doesn't matter where or when in the world or in history, magic has always been the same. It's very basic fundamentals. These are a group of spirits and I need to know the protocols to properly interface with them and get them to like me so that they will work for me on the other side. That is true of every system of magic that has ever existed, at least up to and maybe not even entirely including this whole psychological thing that happened after the Victorian era in the West, but especially the old magic and any culture, any native culture or the Afro-Caribbean communities here in America, you know, most indigenous cultures will kind of practice that old shamanic witchcraft style magic. That basis is always the same. You know, there's certain basics to how you approach spirits or what might make them mad. That's going to be the same in every tradition. And the only time I'll discount somebody's opinion is when they try to say those things aren't true. Or they're trying to explain magic without understanding those basics. And they're trying to make it just a form of psychology. Or they're trying to make it something that, well, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks but me. It works for me. No, that's not really what magic is. You know, and I'll, I'll say that. That's not what magic is. Magic is a system. Magic is a practice. You learn magic the same way you would go to school to learn medicine. And again, I'm not painting all cultures with the same brush. I'm not saying, well, magic is magic, so you can be pick up a grimoire and just replace all the god names with Norse ones, and now you're doing Norse magic. That's not, not what I mean, because there are a lot of cultural specifics that are layered on top of those basics. The spirits of that tradition have requested or required certain things that you have to do, and they will be offended by certain things that you can't do, that this group over here in this culture, you know, their spirits aren't offended by those things and don't care less. So, yes, there's a lot that's culturally specific, and you can't just mix them and match them and think they're all the same. But the basics are the same. Here's the big answer that I've, that I've been meandering toward. One thing I've learned over the years, and I've seen it in my life, and I've seen it through studying history, is that when the people who know those basics the real magicians come together, it has never mattered what culture they're from or what system they use. When the Greek priests came along behind Alexander the Great into the newly conquered Egypt, they didn't go, you all have now have to be Greek. You're all going to worship our gods and do things our way. They went in and said, wow, you guys are doing the same thing we are. And we ended up with this big conglomerate kind of intermixing between the Greek and the Egyptian religions and their, and their magic. Because... Adepts from one culture came down and met adepts from that culture, and they talked shop. And they always do, and they always will. That We'll always be able to recognize each other, and we'll sit and have wonderful conversations with each other. It has nothing to do with whether you're using an Eastern system or a Western system. I mean, look at me and Joshua Gadboy, all the infighting because he is actually a douchebag aside. You don't see us take at each other's throats. You, you don't really see us fighting the way real fights happen. When we insult each other's tradition, it's, it's clearly just a backhanded nudge, nudge, wink, wink, you know, insult to the other person because we're having this little game we're playing. But we're friends. We talk shop. We have a lot of the same ideas on those basics of how magic works because he does know what he's doing. I know chaos magicians who are damn serious and sincere about what they do, and they're not learning everything off of five-minute YouTube videos, and they get real results with their thing because they know the basics. And I know Wiccans who are the same way, and I know demonologists who are the same way. I mean, most of the good demonologists I know are kind of more using Goetia now that Jake Kent has published so much historical material about what Goetia and its practice really is. And a lot of demonologists have been looking for that material for eons, you know, so they're starting to go that way a lot. And a lot of them are very serious and sincere and they get results too. There's a difference between disagreeing with something in a system, 
even with me thinking that Crowley was a wanker who didn't understand one tenth of what he claimed he understood, even with me saying, you know, Rigardi, he's my lineage. I respect that man as, as much as anything else in the world. But I'm not a big fan of his interpreting everything psychologically. So I disagree with him there. And I'll say it's hogwash. And if he were alive, again, I would be fanboying all over him. But I would still say, but, you know, that psychological stuff is really nonsense, right? You know that, right? (laughs) So it's it's not a hostility just because I disagree. And, And so many people see me disagreeing with things. And unfortunately, I've made way too many jokes about the chaos. You know, I'll say, that, you know, I'll say something about magic and how everyone's included and I don't discriminate except for chaos magicians because they're not real. Ha ha. But it is really just a joke, <laughs> just like the thing with me and Joshua. It, it's it's it was meant to be fun. Some just unfortunately took it too seriously. So I stopped doing that. But man, do I have disagreements with chaos magic almost all the way across the board, you know, and I have disagreements with Thelema and I have disagreements with all sorts of stuff. I have disagreements with other Solomonic magician. You know, there's two entirely different schools of Solomonic magicians on how they approach the spirits. Jake Kent published this. They're called the other magicians. There's the one group of, of Solomonic magicians who use commanding curses and I am the image of God and you're going to serve me or or I'm going to put you in fire and burn your sigil and all that nonsense. And I think that's ridiculous because it doesn't get results. It doesn't get good, solid results you can depend on. But then there's another form of Solomonic practice. This is what I practice. The other magicians, we approach the Chthonic entities with as much respect as we would the celestial ones. All things praise God. Everyone's working for God. There is no enemy of God. So these demons are just doing their jobs just like the angels are doing. So I set up a table and I give them food and drink and I make offerings and I say, hey, you know, I'll give you some more if you'll do this work for me. And you build respect and you build a relationship and you make these demons actually like you and want to take care of you rather than just constantly looking for a way to get over on you and get out of the contract because you keep torturing him every time he doesn't come through. You know what I'm saying? Even within my own tradition, I disagree with the way some people work. But again, we can all talk. We all go in there into that Solomonic group and we all talk and there are Thelemites in there and there are Norse magicians in there. And, and I'm very strict on the topic. You have to talk about Solomonic magic. But no one in there attacks other systems. And if one does, I show them the door immediately. It's just about magic. It's about the magic. And when we meet each other, we know that. And it doesn't matter your system. We'll, we'll be able to talk shop. What a rejuvenating message, Aaron. I mean, truly. And I was literally just chatting with someone who recently joined the Solomonic Group and is a Glitch Bottle patron earlier today about this exact same topic. And the comment that was made to me when this person was going through was the different forums and the different questions and the different debates that go on. The the comment truly was, wow, there's so many different opinions and there's so many different discussions and disagreements and counter arguments but the forum is remarkably civil it is remarkably respectful and i think that that's kind of what you're saying is how boring of a world would it be can you imagine if like everyone thought the exact same thing forever for all eternity that would just i think drive people mad and yet it's healthy it's great to have disagreements and healthy respectful arguments because you're getting each other's points and you you're at least even if you disagree you're kind of you're understanding where they're coming from and that kind of adds to the overall context and healthy discussions that you would want in a forum or in a conversation absolutely i've gotten into got a great example of Shradar Ash and Ashan has been on your show uh, more than once he and i have some differences of opinions pretty strong ones actually you know, he's very much into visual appearance, and he makes a very good argument for it that this is what the grimoires are saying, you know, and he quotes from the grimoires. And, and then I'll respond and say, yeah, but here's this grimoire, you know, like the Book of Admiral Ellen, for example, that says don't bother with visual appearance just as long as they've heard you and you've given them the instructions and they follow those instructions, that's all that's necessary, you know. So and we'll go back and forth, but in those back and forth, we know that other people are watching, 
and they're seeing what he's quoting, and they're seeing what I'm quoting, and then they're going to those, thanks to Esoteric Archives and the wonderful Joseph H. Peterson, they go right over there, and they look up these quotes, and they everyone learns, and, you know, you get so many people when a debate like that comes out, you know, following, following, you know, want to learn more, or say more, you know, so people are learning from these debates. You would really stagnate and die, and that's what happens to cults, you know, and, and I don't mean just evil cults like Scientology, cult cult, I mean when a, something becomes cultist, when something is, this is now a closed and fixed system, we know the truth, this is the way to do it, you'll just die. You know, you'll, you'll end up kind of shriveling up and the whole group will just die. It's so funny whenever people accuse me, oh, you're into those old books, you just don't think there can be any innovation, you don't think there can be any change, but we're constantly discovering new things about those books. We're constantly revising things that we thought about them before, finding new information that changes, you know, aspects of what we're already doing. My use of all these altars, I got that from Lakumi. You know, I got that from Stuart Myers, from Ashani Lele, you know, the way he had his Arisha in his house that he could maintain their, their altars and actually talk to them on a daily basis. And so I started developing that, not co-opting Lakumi's rituals at all, but I started seeing it in the grimoires. There are aspects of the grimoires that talk about setting up tables with the right colors and the right candles and making offerings. And of course, the Catholics, you know, they have their altars to saints and stuff that they maintain. And I've learned from all of that. And so here's a, here's a revolution on the Solomonic City. You won't read a Solomonic book that says, well, first set up seven altars in your house for the archangels. And that's where they'll live, and that's where you'll do your work. None of the grimoires say that. There's an advancement. There's a revolution. Because just in that example, I say, you know, the guys who wrote the grimoires, a lot of them were priests. They worked in churches. They did not need to set up altars in their house. <laughs> the altars were there in the church. And plus, you were trying to do all this stuff very quietly without the church finding out or the local inquisitors. So you couldn't set up altars all around your house and just just have it hanging out for the world to see. There's no mention of setting up these kinds of altars, but yet I do, and it is 100% Solomonic. Everything I do at these altars is from the tradition, things that Agrippa has written, things that are in the Key of Solomon, things that are in the Heptameron, but it's an evolution. It's a new thing, and it's something we can do today because no one's going to kick in our door and execute us and our family for having them. A living tradition just keeps growing, but it's not just mix and match. Oh, well, you know, I like this from over here, and I like that from over there. What it really is is that you're working with these entities, and they say, I want you to do this. I want you to put that on my altar. I don't like that color. I need you to get a different altar cloth. I, when you come to my altar to wake me up, I want you to use this prayer from the Heptameron. You know, and you get these instructions as you go. And so even your own practice evolves and becomes more and more powerful as you learn from the spirits. It should never be closed off, and no one should ever believe that Solomonic magicians are just by the book, step by step, nothing more, nothing less. Because if the Solomonic tradition were like that in the medieval era, you wouldn't see that fluidity of correspondences and rituals as different magicians were told by their spirits to do different things. So, yeah, it's always going to grow and change and evolve. To that point, Aaron, we do have a question in terms of building relationships and connections from Mark Edward Hendricks, who's asking, Aaron, do you have a relationship with members of the Palo community in South Florida? For the listeners, Solomon Springs is a bit further up north in north central Florida. So Mark is asking, he's curious as to whether, Aaron, you're involved with a community down in the greater Miami area. No, I'm afraid not. After all the time that we spent with Oshani and my wife, Carrie, as you already know, but the listeners may not, she, where I was learning so much from him and seeing how the concepts he was teaching me applied to the Grimoires, she actually felt more of a call to the actual African entity. She was just so taken with the whole system. And so she ended up becoming Oshani's uh, god sister. He was training her and teaching her to use the Apollo system, uh, Apollo Mayombe which is distinct from Lakumi. They're two different traditions. They just both happen to be of African origin. Apollo Mayombi is a little bit more of a witchcraft system than a religion. That's just a way of putting it into Western terms. I mean, there, I'm sure there are people in Apollo who would say, I just, I just described them incorrectly. But just for the Western listeners, yeah, it's, it's more like a practical system. You know, you need to get stuff done. Whereas Lakumi is, is a religion. You are joining a religion to go there. Through that period... Our entire connection to that world and those communities was through Oshani. Life just kind of, you know, moved. We ended up going to Tampa 
he stayed in Orlando for years and years, maybe a couple of decades. We would visit him from time to time, but we weren't hanging out with him as much. And we certainly weren't going to the Mesa Blancas and the different events we would go to with him. So we kind of lost that connection. And then he moved out to California, which severed it even further. And then, of course, he passed away. So, yeah, our active connection to that community now is more through some people that we know online. Gilberto Strapazon, which is a name you probably recognize, he actually contributed to the Ritual Offerings book that I published. He has a lot of experience with the South American branches like Candomblé and stuff. And there's other people, they're kind of fans of, of Carrie and I because they see so much of a similarity. I'm not butchering his name. I don't think I've ever had to say it out loud like this, but Durthris and Aaron DeWitt, and he's a really nice guy, and he's coming from the African traditions as well. So we know these people. But I couldn't say that just knowing someone online like that gives us any real connection into the, that greater community. And certainly nobody in, in the southern Florida area. We do have a question, Aaron, from Douglas from the What Magic Is This podcast, who is asking, Aaron, what would be your argument for people that dismiss such notions that historical accuracy and context are vitally important to magical efficacy? I wouldn't have a response because I kind of made a promise to my followers I wouldn't respond to those people anymore, and I just I just move on. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> just as we were saying much earlier in this interview about the history that I give in the classes, you know, it's it's that same thing. If if you don't know the context of what you're reading, then you're not going to understand what's being said. A very famous one. Whenever you read in the Bible or in a grimoire, you know, thou must fear God with all of your heart, you know, fear God, fear God. And people go, why should I be afraid of God? What What is wrong with this religion that I'm supposed to be afraid of God? The fact of the matter is, when you look back in history, at the time those texts were written, the word fear was a synonym of the word awe. To fear something meant not to be afraid of it, but to be in awe of it. So if you are in 100% total awe of the grandeur and the cosmic size of what God is, the super cosmic, beyond imagination size of what God is, then you can access this magic. It doesn't mean that, oh, no, God, I'm afraid. Let me go hide under the covers. You know, <laughs> that's just one example. You know, another example, people often hit Psalm 51 and, you know, incended my mother conceive me. That line right there, that's Christianity's one single basis for saying that sex is something God doesn't like, that sex is a sin. A lot of people have understandably turned their backs on that. And when they reach that psalm in one of the spells, they're like, well, what am I supposed to do here? I do not want to stand over something, you know, a spell that I'm trying to do and sit there and state that sex is some kind of bad thing, you know. However... If you study your history and look back and you understand that uh, the Bible, of course, has been translated and retranslated and often translated very purposefully in very political ways to make it sound like it's saying things it's not saying. Older versions of this psalm actually translate to say that I have been a sinner since my mother conceived me. The psalm is being self-deprecating and saying, I'm a screw-up, and I have been from the very moment of my conception, and God, will you please make me a better person? Right, it right. It is not calling his mother a dirty whore for having sex to conceive him. So if you don't understand these contexts, you will not understand what's being said in these old texts, whether it's the Bible or a grimoire or an old receipt book that were very prevalent in, in the foundation of Wicca and the neo-pagan traditions. If you can't read what's being said and you're just interpreting it through your own modern lens, you're just you're not going to get anywhere. And then there's another aspect of this that I want to that I want to put out there, too. Not just so you can understand what's being read, but do not approach a spirit and ask it questions that that spirit knows full well have already been answered in books because they don't respect that. They go, I've already said all that. You know, if, if you're going to work in Naki and Magic and you ask them a question that D already asked and they already answered, they're going to go, there's the book, read it, and then come back to me. They don't take very kindly to people who are lazy that way. They don't respect you, and you have to earn their respect. You have to show them that you're strong and not weak, that you're smart and not stupid, and that you are willing to get off your ass and do the study 
and do the work and the preparations and all the stuff that you think probably shouldn't be necessary, do it anyway, because when you stand in front of that spirit, they're going to go, is this just some idiot who threw three candles onto a tabletop and chanted my name for 20 minutes? Or is this a person that studied and learned and practiced and self-sacrificed and did everything as right as they could do in their heart of hearts. By the way, you can make mistakes and leave things out as long as it was an honest mistake and they'll forgive that, but they want to see that you're true in your heart and they want to see that you put forth the effort. Then they respect you and then they'll answer your questions because you're asking new questions. You've been through the learning material and now you're asking questions that actually matter, and they like that. So there's another reason for studying your history so you know who you're talking to and what you're asking them for. You can't understand Samael unless you study the mythologies about him. You can't understand Michael unless you understand he was once a pagan god named first Nergal in Babylon, then he migrated over to Canaan where he became Reshef. Both of those are underworld war deities. They're in charge of war and plague. But Reshef in the Middle East, Reshef, he had an epithet, which was Michal. He was like El. And so Michal became his name for the Israelites. And they named their archangel Michael. And that's why Michael is the general of the heavenly armies, because he was a war god. And that's why you see icons of Michael holding scales and weighing souls in the scales, because he was once an underworld deity. He's in charge of weighing souls. (laughs) You can't just go to the angel and say, hey, you know, tell me your history, because you're not prepared to hear the history. You don't know enough for that angel to, can, again, that angel would have to first teach you this, which before that he would have to teach you this, and before that he'd have to teach you this. And that's actually what they do. If you ask them to teach you something, you're going to find books and teachers and even websites and videos and all sorts of stuff is just going to start flowing into your life that gives you better and better insights onto the question you asked to that particular angel or spirit. They can't just hand you the answer. They have to guide you to the answer. So, yeah, you have to do the book work. The history is important. That kind of ties into something that you've touched on all podcast, which are the weaving of different themes. And we have a listener question from Love Jungle who is asking, Aaron, magicians like Stephen Skinner have drawn a clear line between magic and mysticism, believing magic to be more practical and mysticism more the path to liberation, another matter altogether. Yet other magicians believe that these two paths are intimately interwoven. What is your take on this? I agree in kind of the differences between them. You know, I can see where they come to that understanding. You know, mysticism is... Well, everything that I've talked about of building the relationship with, with the other side. Again, and not just with the angels and spirits, but, you know, in the pure sense of mysticism, of self-rectification, moving yourself up close to God, that's what you're doing for the whole Abramelin thing. That's why you're not allowed to use other rituals. You just pray. You just pray again and again, day after day, multiple times a day. That's mysticism. And then magic is the more practical angle of that, where you take what you, you know, you move closer to God. You've got relationships with these other entities. You have this army to help support you, uh, your ancestors, your patrons, your familiars, all of this stuff that you gather together, and then you can put it to use. The book of Abermelon says, you know, your guardian angel will give you the sacred magic, but if you don't use it to help your neighbor, your angel will take it back away. You have to apply it to the physical world. That's kind of the difference between a Western magician who knows he has to go out and help women have safe childbirth, heal diseases and sicknesses, do divinations to find lost and stolen items, all that good stuff. Otherwise, your magic is useless. Otherwise, all the mysticism is useless. You're just raising yourself up and making yourself a better you know, as the Golden Dawn says, to become more than human. Well, if you want to become more than human, then go sit in a corner. You're no good to nobody. But where I disagree is where this ridiculous idea has come up over the past, you know, a couple of decades or so that the two are just two separate practices and you can do one or the other. You can do mysticism without magic. A lot of, you know, your Eastern systems are that way. But you cannot do magic without the mysticism. You cannot work the magic without first going through that process of rectification, elevation, making your contacts on the other side, becoming closer to God, you know, whatever system you're using or how you're doing this, gain your spiritual authority so that you are actually someone who is recognized on that side of the veil. And when you ask for things, you'll get responses. 
just like me with the book of Abermelon, I thought I could just take seven tablets of wax and scrawl a line on them and bury them and it should work. And it didn't. I had to do the mysticism. I had to spend eight days in purification and prayer and doing this ritual to consecrate the talisman day after day. And then the spirits were linked to it. Then they paid attention to me. I had a miraculous result with that particular working. So, yeah, you cannot do magic without the mysticism. And I'll I'll argue with anyone who says that you can't. I mean, you can try. You know, you might even have some latent psychic talent, so you have some success. But you're not going to really get anywhere special unless you first work on what's inside. And this, by the way, you know, people hear me complain about the psychological view of magic. I'm actually a member of the Golden Dawn. I've gone through their system, and it is very psychological. And it's very centered on you because it is rectifying you and purifying you and helping you get your four elements all together and then charged with spirit. That's where the psychological stuff belongs is in the mystical side of it because you have to work on you first. And then you can actually start doing things for other people. (laughs) Aaron, that actually goes on to a kind of a theme about overlapping and defining, not defining things. And we have a listener question from Matthias Sundby, who's asking, the spirit lists within the grimoires are somewhat overlapping and quote-unquote defined. Have you, Aaron, any thoughts on how they got seals for each demon originally, and have you been able to contact any new ones, i.e., is it through the established ones to get into contact with new ones? But then Matthias is asking, well, how were they originally able to get into contact with the demons in the first place? Well, that kind of goes back to like what we've been saying about, you know, magic has been magic for thousands of years. And the whole point of magic has always been to find out how to make contact with and gain the favor of these entities. Yes, I have contacted new spirits. This is mainly through the Abermelon system, because Abraham even tells you in that book, here's my talismans, here's my list of spirits. There's no guarantee you're going to get the same ones. You can write down as many of these spirits as you want, but as you go through your work, Let's say you need a new talisman for a new word square for this. Well, you may get a new spirit, a spirit you haven't heard of before. My four familiars, they're not from any grimoire. They're given to you in the Abermelon ritual from the four kings of the four directions, Oriens, Paimon, Amemon, and Araton. But those four, I got names for them that are not from any grimoire. These are unique entities. They've been with me my whole life, basically. So, yeah, I work with them, and that that has nothing to do with another grimoire. They gave me their own sigils and their own information, and they tell me how they want things done when I'm working with them. Yeah, there's definitely a way to contact new ones. Now, outside of that, I don't really worry too much about contacting new entities because each of these grimoires is kind of a complete system. And like I said, it's astrology. So it's like, okay, here are the angels of the 12 signs. Here's the angels of the 12 planets. Here's all the demons that they govern and command. So what's the point of looking for a new spirit? The ones you need are already there. You know, (laughs) whatever you need help with in life, there's already an angel, you know, or there's already a spirit that can do that thing. So there's really, I don't know, maybe hubris or overriding desire to do something new. I don't know, but I don't see the practical use of spending my time trying to find entirely new spirits in the systems that already have established spirits with histories and with lore and with already established sigils. Now, as for how those sigils came about, we're pretty sure some of them were just scribed. You know, you would you take all this belladonna and all these noxious chemicals and stuff, and the demon would show up, and you'd see patterns and draw those patterns down, and that's the sigil. But there's a lot of them that are just constructed out of different, like, Kabbalistic-style methods of taking the letters of the name, arranging them around in different ways so that you get a, a pictographical image of the spirit's name. So a lot of them, even in the groom wars, a lot of them came from doing that. We don't even know the methods that all of them use. Some of it's just conjecture on our part. So sometimes it is a thought out, you know, like if you want to contact Michael and you have no sigil for Michael, there are things, and uh, Agrippa teaches them, and I think it's also in the fourth book of occult philosophy, on how to generate your own sigils until you can contact the entity, and then the entity can say, but I want you to use this sigil instead and give you a new one. That's pretty much how that works. 
The final listener question, Aaron, from Matthias Sunby. Matthias is asking, if the grimoire tradition has a shamanistic foundation with regards to where it began, why is the Christian overlay still needed? Matthias is asking, is it possible to totally sand away the Christian overpaint, so to speak? No. I mean, again, I hate to be redundant, but we're talking about how magic is the same no matter where or when. But I also stressed that each culture has their own overlay to it. And it's not just a convenient overlay. It is what that tradition's spirits or deities told these people. If you're going to contact me, you need to do it on this day when the sun is in this position. And I need to have these things on the altar and you need to be wearing this. Just like I said with my altars here, it didn't happen all at once. It evolved very slowly over a long period of time. So you can't just scrape the Christian veneer off of the Grim Wars because they are Christian magic. Again, like in my classes, the second class is dedicated 100% to the lore. You have to study the lore of these beings to know who you're dealing with and how they'll react to certain things. And also to get symbols and stuff that you can use, you know, to work with them. The whole story of Tobit, which is only in the Catholic Bible, but there's a whole story where Tobit's son, Tobias, makes a journey. And he's this guy just walks up and joins them, this guy holding a fish and just walks with him on his whole journey. And it turns out to be the Archangel Raphael. And he was there to protect him on his journey. And there's other things that happen in the story, too. But you can't really know Raphael unless you've read that story. Because you see there is personality. You see there the things that he does, the things that he's in charge of, the way he reacts positively and negatively to different things in the story. And if you don't know those things, you can't effectively work with Raphael because he's more like a stranger to you. How could you strip off the Judeo-Christian veneer of the grimoires without losing all of that lore. And then if you've lost all that lore, how are you going to work with those entities? So again, it's the context. You know, these people were trying to contact real beings and the beings they were trying to contact happened to be the Judeo-Christian ones. Now I will say this, because a lot of people miss this. The Christianity in the grimoires is not the Christianity of the church. In fact, it is so much the opposite of the Christianity of the church that the famous witch burnings that took place in the medieval era, those inquisitions were not started because of witches. They started burning witches when they ran out of fellow Christians to burn. That's what the inquisitions were started for, was to find heretic Christians inside the church. Those are the same people who were writing the Solomonic grimoires. Being caught with one of those books was a capital offense. And it happened a lot. The Grimoires are a rebellion against that Orthodox, I don't mean Orthodox Christianity, the group, I mean Christian Orthodoxy. They are a rebellion against Christian Orthodoxy. The Satan described in the Grimoires is not Lucifer who tried to wage war on God and got cast down into hell and is now the embodiment of all evil and hate. The Satan in the Bible is a mercurial trickster spirit who lives at crossroads and who is in charge of the four demons of the directions and thus of all four elements of all of created matter. And that's why you can go to the crossroads and give him wishes and make deals with him because he's in charge of everything, which is also why he showed up to Jesus and said, hey, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you'll just not do this crucifixion thing because all the kingdoms of the earth were his to give. That's the Satan and the Grim Wars. And you'll see people mention that like Satan and Lucifer and Samuel are actually all different entities that religion is kind of conflated into one. Same, you know, Beelzebub, Asmodeus. You know, if you go to any church website, these are all just different names for the same guy, the bad guy who waged war on God. And now he's the enemy of all mankind and we should have nothing to do with him. But in reality, there's a lot of different personas at work here and a lot of different spirits. And none of this, in the Grim Wars, not one bit of it actually links up with Christian orthodoxy. They're not worshiping the same kind of God. They're not working with the same kind of Satan. <laughs> you know, their view of the archangels is entirely different. You don't have to accept what these televangelists are telling you or what your local church is telling you or what the Pope is saying in order to work with the Grim Wars because they're completely, again, it's like apples and oranges. So these were Christians that 
really didn't buy all of the stuff that people dislike about the church today. It's really more of an exploration of that rebellion than it is giving in to Christianity in its mainstream form. I wanted to ask you about your future projects and perhaps future announcements. Is there anything that you can share with the listeners today? Well, it just so happens that, because we've been talking about the classes that are all at the Doc Solomon's website, and you already know we sell all sorts of great magical ingredients there, uh, consecrated incenses, candles that are already dressed and blessed and charged and ready to go, consecrated parchment, butterfly blood ink, all the really obscure stuff that it's hard to find <laughs> anywhere else. We try to specialize in that. And, of course, we have those classes that we offer. So what I want to do is kind of provide another vector for people. Some people aren't really set up to take classes. Either they're a little too expensive to take all at once, or they're not really looking, you know, like some people are not Solomonic magicians, so they don't want to go take a Solomonic one-on-one course, even though you should anyway. But (laughs) I wanted to open up another vector where I could do something similar to what's on Facebook where, you know, I'll just, I'll think of something to talk about and I'll just write a post about it and then let my, let my followers start sharing it around. And I think that a lot of people like that information, but there are people who, you know, the the whole TLDR thing, they don't really want to read long posts. Facebook is just kind of a bam, 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 one thing after the next thing. And also, whenever I post there, it's hard for people to find those posts again. So I thought, why not make videos instead? It'll save me a lot of writing. I can actually put effort on writing toward my classes and my books where it should be because I've kind of taken a break from that for a while. And then people can just go watch these short videos and we'll just pick a subject and we'll, I'll just talk about it. Maybe do Q and A's, maybe uh, have conversations between me and other well-known magicians, all sorts of different things we can do in just very short, simple videos. So I just recently set up a Patreon account for this and I'll be sharing the videos there. And of course, you don't have to be a member to see my videos. You're going to get an early release as a patron, and you're also going to have the ability to have some input on what subjects get discussed or explained. And then uh, about a month later or so, uh, basically when I create the next content, I'll take the old content and I'll put it on YouTube for free. So you're always going to be able to see the material. Nothing is walled off. And of course, I have several tiers already set up, and that's just going to do things like get you discounts at Doc Solomon's for all the magical ingredients you want to buy. It's going to get you special access to uh, the classes. The one tier gets you uh, one full course each year that you can take for free. And then another tier will add on all of the one-off classes, which we don't have any one-off classes up yet, but that's one of the plans for this new year is to start generating some of those. So there's going to be a lot of content that you can get early access to and have a part in on the Patreon page. So I think that's going to be a lot of fun, and I think it's going to be a lot easier than making people sift through my Facebook profile for things that <laughs> things that, I, that I've said or talked about that they want to know more about. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. By the time this podcast airs, it'll, it'll be out. It is uh, patreon.com slash Aaron Leach, all one word, and uh, we'll definitely make sure to link to it. I think that's such a fantastic idea, Aaron. It, it sounds so awesome, and that direct support is just so amazing to see that amount of support and interest and engagement. Author, magician, scholar, awesome guy, Aaron Leach, thank you just so much for taking the time and sharing your wisdom with the listeners today you are more than welcome and and you know it works both ways because you don't know how many people have come to me in the past few months and said hey i i found you through the glitch bottle podcast i was listening to an old podcast and heard you on there and they want to know more and they want to know more about the shop and the classes and stuff so this is such a wonderful investment of time to be here with you and i always have so much fun talking to you so I'm always glad to to sit down and, and have a discussion. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that many faceted jewel of a conversation with Aaron Leach. He is so full of wisdom, and I especially loved how he talked about it's important to be respectful to others, but also being able to disagree. I think that's such an important point, especially in today's day and age, as well as his discussion about Raphael in Soul and Mikhail in Mercury and all of the different correspondences. Just so many important things to keep in mind. As always, thanks goes to each and every 
every Glitch Bottle patron on Patreon, where patrons can enjoy exclusive perks and benefits. But most importantly, you, yes, you help keep the lights on and you fuel the show in new and interesting ways. After my morning rituals, going through and chatting with Glitch Bottle patrons and throughout the day is a huge honor and it is so insightful. I definitely hope that listeners can show some esoteric love and support to Aaron Leach, who is now on Patreon. And if you're also inspired, you can always check out Glitch Bottle on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. And you can subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. Oh, and leaving a good review or stars or a thumbs up or whatever they have on Apple Podcasts and Spotify is always most welcome if you feel so inclined. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Thank you.